Good afternoon. Before we begin, I want to remind the committee members and members of the public to follow our code of conduct at meetings. This includes commenting on the specific agenda item only and addressing the full body. 
Public speakers will not engage in conversation with the committee members or staff, and all members of the committee, staff, and the public are expected to refrain from abusive language. Failure to comply with the code of conduct, which will disturb, disrupt, or impede the orderly conduct of this meeting, will result in removal from the meeting. And now I will call the meeting of the Neighborhood Services and Education Committee to order. Will the clerk please call the roll? Candelas? Here. Torres? Here. Duan? Ortiz? Present. And Davis? Here. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we will move to item B, which is a review of the work plan. We have one item that is being dropped. I believe this will come back uh, with a different work plan. So we need a motion to drop this item. Motion to drop item. Second. Thank you. Are there any members of the public who need to speak on this? We have no hands raised. Okay, let's vote. Do you guys see that on your end, the no. voting? No. Okay, it's probably not working. I can take a verbal vote. That's okay, we can just That's say fine. all in favor. Aye. 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 Okay, thank you. All right, motion passes, thank you. All right, we have nothing on the consent calendar, so we'll move right into uh, reports to committee. Item D1 is Animal Care and Services Annual Report. Matt Lesh is here with his team. Matt, start us off. Good afternoon, council. Members of the public, I am Matt Lesh, Director of Public Works, and we are here to present the Animal Care and Services Annual Report. With me today is Jay Tirado, our Deputy Director, and Kiska Icard, the Division Manager of Shelter Operation, and Dr. Elizabeth Cather, the Division Manager for Medical Operations. We are proud to be here today to share what we've been working with and been working on with our community and with our animals. Um, our shelter and many other shelters in our area and in our nation are in crisis. You'll hear more about some of those details and the challenges we experience. And it's not just at the shelter that our animals are in crisis, but it's in our community as well. There are many drivers to this and many things that need to be done to cure the, the issues that are at crisis. We're never claiming to be perfect, but we have a lot that we've achieved over the last year, and we're excited to talk about it. We have a lot to achieve that we've achieved with our partners in our community. So I'll kick it over to Jay and we'll walk through our presentation and we'll be happy to engage with the conversation. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon, council members and community members. Uh, my name is Jay Torado, deputy director over at ACS and here to report on the Animal Care and Services Annual Report. So Animal Care and S Services uh, is located at uh, 2750 Monterey Road and those are the services that we provide to the community. Uh, we also uh, provide, uh, in addition to serving the communities of San Jose, we also provide contract cities, uh, provide services to the contracted cities of Malpitas, Cupertino, Saratoga, and Los, the town of Los Gatos. We're also um, partners uh, with other shelters, uh, which is uh, under the We Care Alliance. And as uh, Matt stated, uh, our uh, problem at the shelter is also experienced by many shelters uh, across California and the United States. And um, one of the biggest problems that uh, shelters are facing are overpopulation of animals. Uh, many animals um, in the shelter struggle with the high number of intakes and a decrease in the live outcome options for animals. Some shelters have also communicated publicly that they are euthanizing uh, to create more space. The need for more resources, including Additional staff, veterinarians, and increasing live outcome options are often highlighted by animal shelter directors and CEOs. <clears throat> Excuse me. The shortage of veterinarians and RVTs and the increasing cost of veterinary care uh, have also affected the community and other animal organizations as a whole. As a result, many animals end up in the shelter. Uh, San Jose Animal Care and Services has also been affected and have experienced operational and staffing challenges in the last couple of years. Just prior to this fiscal year, San Jose Animal Care and Services suffered significant losses in both shelter and medical operations. Our shortage of medical staff triggered the loss of trap, neuter, and release, and also limiting the ability to provide uh, spay, neuter, and vaccination services uh, internally. Our rescue partners were also affected by the changes at ACS. 
ACS will work with the community and partners, including shelters and rescues, to work together and create solutions to address the current crisis facing the community and the animal shelter. And with that, I will pass it on to Kiska. The animal care and services total intake for fiscal year 2022 to 2023 was 11,031 animals, a decrease of 29% or 4,588 less animals when compared to the overall animal intake from fiscal year 21-22. Last fiscal year, a greater percentage of animals arrived at our doors with unhealthy or untreatable illnesses. This was largely due to our prioritization of accepting animals who truly need urgent care, those who are sick and injured. The rising costs of veterinary care and increased demands for veterinary services have added additional strains on ACS resources. A primary cause of the drop of animal intake was the suspension of the trap, neuter, and release program for cats and kittens, as well as low-cost public spay-neuter services. This is also the single greatest contributor to the drop in ACS's live release rate. Regarding animal outcomes, ACS launched a foster program pr primarily for neonate and underage kittens. Between January and June of this year, 1,451 animals were placed in foster homes. A major ACS accomplishment last fiscal year was a dramatic increase in our adoption program. ACS experienced a 22% increase in adoptions with approximately 3,400 animals adopted into loving homes, while at the same time the number of animals euthanized decreased. During fiscal year 2022-2023, even though euthanasia rates are around the same or lower when compared to previous fiscal years, more animals died, 426 animals to be exact, when compared to the last five the last five fiscal years. A major factor that led to the increase in animal deaths experienced at ACS was the increase in the number of unhealthy and untreatable animals that were impounded at the shelter when compared to the last previous fiscal years. One area of improvement for this current fiscal year will be rebuilding rescue partnerships. As to the rescue outcomes for fiscal year 2022-2023, they decreased by approximately 68% when compared to previous fiscal years. ACS acknowledges rebuilding rescue partnerships is important to the overall outcome and in fiscal year 2022-2024, ACS staff is working to increase rescue collaboration and live outcomes. Working with rescue partners will help decrease the average length of stay. Historically, the average length of stay for animals has hovered at approximately 10 to 12 days. Unfortunately, the length of stay for animals at the shelter increased dramatically this year for 23 days for dogs and 15 days for cats. The live release rate for dogs is very high at 95%. The live release, re re live release rate for cats has dipped to 79%, in large part to the suspension of our TNR program. Prior to the pandemic, San Jose Animal Care and Services provided between four and 5,000 trap neuter return surgeries and public spay neuter services annually. Last year, that number dropped to 1,257. Additionally, the increase in intake of unhealthy and untreatable animals meant there were less healthy animals, reducing the probability of a live outcome. The ACS combined dog and cat live release rate for fiscal year 2022 to 2023 was 85%. ACS appreciates the support of the community, partners, and city staff that have adopted, fostered, and donated to the shelter. We want to celebrate some of our community and staff by thanking them and sh sharing some pictures from adoptions and events. Hi, uh, 
so discussing the medical operations, as was mentioned before, there was a, a loss of key full-time veterinary staff at the beginning of the fiscal year. Uh, there was a, about a six-month period where the shelter was struggling on uh, two part-time veterinarians to maintain the medical at the entire facility. I, uh, with the restructuring um, of the city, the medical director and director position uh, was posted, and I started there uh, the end of August, beginning of September of 2022. We still had severe veterinary shortages and support staff shortages. Uh, we had vacancies for two additional full-time veterinarians, one of which we filled about two to three months after I began. The other was only filled a few months ago this year. Um, so uh, the public spay and neuter, um, one of my, my missions was I'm very passionate about TNR. I, I believe strongly that it's, it's a huge, huge service to the community. And with the shortage of staff and the, the overcapacity of animals in the shelter, it was a challenge to figure out how, how we can bring this, even on a limited basis, back to the city. So in February, we reinstituted TNR. At that time, we were able to do 10 to 15, three days a week. But again, we had shifting in staff shortages that we were forced to reduce, but continue <coughs> TNR for the public uh, to one day a week. Um, In-house, uh, with the vet staff we have, we have done over 3,600 surgeries. Um, we've also contracted out services for spay and neuter um, to other agencies for spay-neuter, and over 850 have been done at external partners. In addition to the high-quality, high-volume spay-neuter, the medical staff at the shelter has completed over 140 additional non-spay-neuter surgeries. These include anything from limb amputations to full mouth extractions to damaged eye removals to more traumatic surgeries, hernia repairs, you name it. And we've started keeping track so that that information will be available to the members of our community. Um, sorry. <laughs> um, oh, it's, it's, in addition to all the surgeries, the high volume, high volume spay neuter within the shelter, the shelter is also operating as an emergency clinic seven days a week. As you know, we have a field uh, office that brings emergencies from the field. We also every day get emergencies from members of the public, fosters that contact us during business hours with emergencies. So every day is a, a triage game of trying to maximize how many animals we can get fixed, prioritize the uh, injured surgeries, as well as triage every emergency every day that comes through our door. Uh, we get a vehicular trauma at least one to two every day. Um, and you never know what's gonna walk in the door, so it's, it's a challenge and we're always on our toes. Um, this is just a very, very, very small snippet of the hundreds of animals that, as we've discussed, have come in with what the, the matrix with the coalition describes as untreatable, unmanageable conditions. It would be easy for us to only take in healthy animals. Our live release rate would be probably near 100%. But we take these untreatable, unhealthy. These are just a snippet of the ones that uh, we, we give them a chance. If we feel that they have a fighting chance, our philosophy has changed at SJAX that we're gonna give them that chance. You see some of these dogs here had severe traumatic brain injuries. They were hit by a car. That requires immediate medical intervention. Some of them were comatose for two days. These dogs, Tabby, one that I, I took home, have video with my, my daughter. <laughs> She's learning how to walk again. Within a week, you wouldn't have recognized that this dog was comatose. Uh, this little kitten in the bottom is one of the many, many, many kittens that have survived a, a deadly virus called feline panleukopenia. Even though we know that that virus has a high mortality, uh, up to 90% do not survive without treatment, we provide that care, and if we feel that they're healthy and strong enough to make it through, then we're gonna give them that chance, and we're happy to, to take the numbers. 50, 51% have survived and we will keep trying and giving them that chance. Thank you, Dr. Cater. On, um, in addition to our shelter and medical staff, um, and uh, our shelter operations also has uh, our volunteer, uh, awesome volunteers that continue to come into the shelter. 
uh, every day and every week to uh, help out our overall operation. So definitely uh, appreciative of all the volunteers that come in. Uh, our field unit uh, consists of uh, around 23 personnel, uh, dispatchers, field officers, and a supervisor and uh, uh, senior officers or uh, sergeants. They completed nearly uh, 17,000 calls for service, uh, which is a 16% decrease from the previous fiscal year. Uh, that is um, mostly due to the vacancies that we had in the field unit. Uh, as of this year, currently, uh, four out of the five vacancies have been filled, and four new officers are currently in training, and we are um, estimating that they'll be um, completed with their training in another uh, three or four months. Uh, but they have been able to decrease the number of calls. Uh, I, I believe at one point uh, for this year uh, uh, was around 600 calls, so now they're uh, around the 300 mark. And as uh, mentioned earlier, we, uh, our officers uh, answer calls for service within San Jose, Milpitas, Cupertino, Saratoga, and uh, the town of Los Gatos. And uh, the field team uh, responds to any animal-related uh, calls, including criminal investigations, and help out uh, any law enforcement, fire, and uh, also respond to uh, rescuing animals out in the field. And our uh, other section is the administrative uh, unit, uh, which is uh, typically there'll be uh, the hardworking staff that are in front of the shelter uh, taking uh, customer service, uh, making those first contact at the shelter and helping out with our overall operation. They also uh, take in uh, donations. Uh, and last fiscal year, we received over $490,000. And uh, they also process animal licensing. And uh, last fiscal year, revenue was around $1.6 million. And um, cost recovery for uh, ACS is 28% uh, for this fiscal year. Our fiscal year 2022-2023 accomplishments include two management positions, two new senior management positions, an assistant shelter director with a focus on shelter operations started in late June 2022, and a medical director who oversees all medical operations started in August of 2022. We also added contra contractual custodial staff Five custodial staff were added to the shelter to provide additional cleaning to the kennels. This allows shelter staff to improve support and adoptions, intake, and other responsibilities. During spring of 2022, ACS leadership applied and was awarded a consultation audit for Maddie's Fund, a nonprofit organization. ACS was awarded the consultation in spring of 2022, and Maddie's Fund team conducted the on-site co consultation in May of 2022. Sorry, July of 2022. Many of the recommendations have been implemented, and ACS staff continues to work towards implementing the remaining recommendations. After a majority of the recommendations have been completed, ACS staff will request Maddie's Fund organization reassess and evaluate our progress. The pet compass system has allowed the public to access stray and adoptable pets more easily, including animals needing help from rescue partners. We also increased staff training opportunities, including a full day workshop provided to staff and volunteers on safe handling practices, reading body language, and understanding aggression in dogs. Staff training curriculum has also been updated to include safe handling and sanitation materials from both ASPCA Pro and Maddie's University. We also implemented Dogs Playing for Life. Many staff and volunteers are trained on running large dog play groups using the Dogs Playing for Life model. Approximately 10 or more dogs are taken out at a time, helping to improve their socialization, exercise, and their enrichment while they're at the shelter. We've also concentrated on boosting our recruitment for volunteers to help with animals at the shelter. Since January this year, around 1,000 volunteers have signed up to become volunteers for ACS. We've also expanded our medical area and the shelter hospital was expanded, allowing hospitalized animals to remain within eyesight of the medical staff, improving overall, their overall care. We've also completed a new foster headquarters, which is a dedicated workspace that is easily accessible for foster parents, and it provides 24-hour support for those that are fostering. 
We've also installed synthetic gra grass, began the process of installing synthetic grass in selected outdoor areas throughout the shelter, which can be easily disinfected and helping to reduce the amount of dirt track through the shelter on little muddy paws. We've also completed our cat kitten portal installations, which was completed early this year. The portals allow cats and kittens access to another cage, which not only allows them to have more room and separate spaces to eat and rest away from their litter boxes, portals have also been proven to reduce stress for, shelter, for, for cats in a shelter environment. Additionally, ACS built two large play yards, approximately 700 square feet each, in previously underutilized areas to expand dogs, to expand space for dogs to exercise and meet potential adopters. For our systems and operational improvements, we've implemented vet check reports, and that also eliminated paper-based record keeping and we've implemented reports to ensure animals who are on, on medication needing veterinary exams or who are due for recheck examinations receive timely medical care and treatment. We've also implemented observation reporting QR codes. The QR code system was implemented to allow volunteers, staff, and also members of the public to provide a medical or kennel observation, including pictures and email. The system allows supervisors and managers to reply directly to the sender via email. There's also been improvements in our animal inventory. In August of 2023, medical staff implemented the use of an iPad to improve the staff's ability to enter and read real-time information regarding vaccination status, medical condition, medical treatments, surgery information, and, and other information. We also have a real-time dashboard tracking system Public Works IT staff developed a dashboard to create real-time information on shelter capacity, cleaning, feeding, statistics, and other services which have been completed for the animals. The dashboard management system won an international special achievement in, in GIS that was awarded to the City of San Jose in recognition of this outstanding work with GIS technology. Additionally, vaccination on intake has been implemented. Staff has per begun performing vaccination on intake for all animals who do not require specialized handling. This last fiscal year, we've also increased our community outreach. ACS staff has participated in many events, including technical school, school recruitment fairs, wellness fairs, animal adoption fairs, dog park ribbon cutting ceremonies, and two animal shel shelter open houses for city staff. We have also performed free, microchi free microchipping at several community events. Community outreach that started in late May gained media and community attention, which resulted in a total of 591 adoptions in the month of May. That's the highest uh, number of adoptions in 2023. ACS also worked with the Office of Emergency Services, supporting approximately 40 displaced people with their pets to ensure they were not separated during the two flood evacuation periods that occurred early in 2023. Additionally, ACS worked with our San Jose Library Department and launched the Bunnies and Books program. The goal was to demonstrate humane care for rabbits and promote the Foster to Adopt program to interested community members. We have also begun performing kitten foster parent training at our community libraries. Additionally, ACS worked with SJ Beautify and the Housing Department to mitigate pets impacted by camp clean cleanups and abatements. Additionally, staff continued its collaboration with St. Francis Animal Protection Society to help unhouse pet owners and their pets. Thank you, Kiska. And um, so uh, as Matt stated, we still have um, work to do uh, within our division and these are our uh, 
key focus areas moving forward, uh, one of which is uh, strengthening our uh, relationship with our rescue partners. And um, whether it's internal or external, we uh, want to uh, enhance and uh, improve our ability to uh, provide TNR and uh, internal spay and neuter, uh, improve our training, uh, update and communicate proto uh, medical protocols and um, because of the overcrowding in shelters, we want to ensure that we expand our live outcome and options and opportunities. We will continue to implement the Maddie's Million Pet Challenge recommendations, and uh, as Kiska mentioned, we will uh, reach out. We have started the communication with the um, Maddie's group to try and get a date for when uh, we can get a reevaluation. And um, finally, uh, implement the updated Association, Association of Shelter Veterinarian Guidelines that, uh, that was released in uh, December of 2022. And uh, finally, we, we definitely appreciate the hard work of our staff, our volunteers, our partners, uh, which are shelter partners and also rescues, and our community. Uh, we have faced many challenges in the last couple years, and regardless of the challenges, we will continue to help and work with our partners and the community uh, to help out the animals that are in need. Uh, that is the end of our presentation. Thank you. Thank you. We'll go to members of the public. We have eight public speaker cards. We will start with the in-person speakers and then head on to Zoom after. Um, can we have Ninara Parker, Lynn L., Jennifer Flick, Dina or Dinah Hayes, Anna Spear, Dr. Monica, last name R, Mike Wagner, and Levi. Please make their way, um, please line up along the front steps of the podium. Security will let you know when it's time to go down to the podium. You will have two minutes to speak. Please state your name prior to doing that. Thank you. This is the first person who comes down. You don't have to come in order. Um, There's no specific the order. Whenever you're ready. makes it down. And then um, the rest of you, if you, if you need to, to sit, if you don't want to stand, you can sit in the front row where it says reserved. Thank you. Oh, okay, thank you. Hi, my name is Lynn Lamoureux. In September, I found an unresponsive cat head down in his crumbling litter box in a dirty kennel at the shelter. He was just another anonymous cat that died while in care, but he mattered to me. I can still see him when I close my eyes at night. More than 500 cats so far have died in their kennels this calendar year. I have volunteered for over seven years at the San Jose Animal Care Center, and I have witnessed firsthand the conditions getting worse in the past two years. I have sent numerous emails to shelter and city management, which have mostly yet to be answered. I have participated in good faith in the animal advocate meeting, which have resulted in no action items that I have seen. During this time, cats are still being warehoused and are still suffering and dying while chaos reigns. Medical tickets submitted via the QR codes by volunteers are still being ignored. We get no response, or if we get a response, about 30% of them, we get, this cat will be checked. No date, no outcome, nothing, sorry. Ringworm and Panduk protocols are not being followed. Cross-contamination is still impacting operations. Staff call-outs are still impacting operations. Rooms are not clean or cats fed on time because there's not enough staff and volunteers have to pick up the slack where we can. The shelter runs out of essential supplies like litter, food trays, litter boxes, carriers, and food on a regular basis. Volunteers are not valued and their concerns are being ignored. There are not enough volunteers to socialize adoptable cats on a daily basis right now. So changes are needed. Effective and compassionate leadership, strong communication skills, and transparency are essential to turn this around. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Hi. Thank you, NSE committee members. I appreciate the opportunity to speak. My name is Jennifer Flick. For several years, I've been a volunteer for SJAX, a rescue partner, and I founded an animal rescue transport club. Last year, I became concerned about the direction in which the shelter was heading, and I started to speak up about it. The decline in basic care, medical care, the number of animals dying, the collapse of the live release rate, the large drop in intake numbers in spite of the increased budget, the sudden resistance on the part of the shelter to work with long-trusted rescue partners, as well as the removal of key staff and volunteers for speaking out and asking questions. 
the euthanasia of animals who had rescue commitments, like Lola. Our voices are not being heard despite months of meetings with shelter management and city leaders. Since my voice isn't being heard today, I will read to you an email from a staff member to Shelter Director Jay Torado. More information has been submitted for public record. Hi, Jay. Regarding medical notes not being entered, here are two recent examples. There have been other instances where medical records were incomplete or not uploaded or until someone requested them. Regarding Husky Puppy with Broken Leg, you're aware of this situation. I did find just now that Dr. Kather added to the medical notes today after the PRA was made. The note was created 613, then edited, added to on 628, then added to again today 76. This is problematic because the Humane Society would have been given a printout of the medical history when they picked up the puppy, and new medical notes will be different but still look as if they were completed on 613. If BASH already has a copy of the medical history that was provided to HSSB, this will look shady. Thank you. Uh, there are screenshots attached to the email which was submitted via public record. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you. Next speaker. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Dr. Monica Rudiger. I'm a local veterinarian and have 19 years of shelter medicine experience. I'm also a former rescue partner of the San Jose Animal Care Center from 2009 to 2020, end of 2020. I'm currently medically retired but volunteering my time to help save some of the animals who've suffered from neglect and mismanagement at SJAX. I'm here today to dispel the myth that animals coming into the shelter are, are during the fiscal year 2022 to 23 are more unhealthy and untreatable than in past years. Repeating a false narrative over and over does not make it true. Sadly, what is true that is that the unhealthy, defenseless, sick, and injured animals are not receiving adequate medical care and spend many weeks and often months without resolution of their issues. In past years, sick and injured animals were placed immediately on the needs rescue list within 24 to 72 hours of intake into the shelter, and rescue groups were contacted on a daily basis so that those with greatest medical needs received the best outcome possible. Today, rescue groups are not contacted and the animals stay in the shelter and suffer for weeks untreated. I have spent hundreds of hours volunteering my time to treat cats that have already spent weeks at SJAX who still needed leg amputations, feeding tubes for starvation, blood transfusions for anemia, had wounds cleaned that had maggots in them, had toes exposed and rotting, had teeth, full of, um, teeth removed that were rotten, um, and had life-saving treatment for severe panleukopenia, acute kidney failure, and had emergency surgery for intestinal intussusception. The animals deserved better, and sadly, it was the volunteers who recognized their state of poor health, not the medical staff. Shelter man management has been aware of all of these conditions and yet continue to recite the mantra that animals are sicker than they've ever been before, and we're giving them a chance. That's why more are dying in care. As a veterinarian with 24 years of experience, I say that is utter nonsense, and since nothing is changing... Thank you. Next speaker. Thank you. Hi, I'm Nineveh Parker, representing Town Cats of Morgan Hill Rescue, as well as Palo Alto Humane. In 2020, 2023 year, it looks like the rescue um, partnerships have declined. Um, my time at Town Cats, um, exposes that many times I we would try to transfer cats out of SJAX and help you and um, offer our support to minimize capacity issues but were rejected or told that animals were not available and the animals that were transferred were usually dying and sick and untreated and lack of medical records were sent along with them my question is what decision was made to prevent us rescues from pulling these cats so that we could minimize clearly what is happening in the shelter, which is the length of stay has increased. Animals are being adopted when they're sick and not being treated. At the end of the day, what, what, what decision was made to not allow rescues to pull from nest jacks? The other point I wanted to bring up was at Palo Alto Humane, in the last year, we have financially assisted 700 TNR cases, all from 
San Jose, which is, I understand that's the issue and you guys are working on it, but I wanted to bring up the fact that we have helped TNR the cats that should have been TNR'd at SJAX. And that's all I have to say. Thank you, next speaker. Hi, my name is Dinah. I am a foster, a cat advocate, and a trap neuter return volunteer. I think I have trapped cats in every single district for all of you who are up here. <laughs> and I wanted to thank everybody for coming down and you can see that people care deeply. It's not just the people in the audience. I do believe that the shelter staff and representatives and city leadership cares as well. It does seem like there are still ongoing issues and that there is a communication and or trust problem. Again, I'm going to say I know there's an audit coming. I still don't believe an audit can solve a relationship problem. So I would urge a, that the city consider a third party, an independent third party facilitator and mediator, perhaps in addition to the audit to work on some of these issues. At this point, emotions and history has taken over, and I don't know that we'll be able to solve this on our own, even with your assistance. So please take that into consideration. And I would again thank the shelter for all the work that they have done. It is not an easy job, and I know that it would be insurmountable for anybody. Thank you. Next speaker. Good afternoon. My name is Anna Spear. I'm a uh, volunteer. I'm also um, mainly a volunteer. Sometimes I help foster, but mainly volunteer. Um, there's a couple of things. Uh, the 950 animals that they've said have been at the shelter throughout this year on their high side. That was the number, having that number at the shelter is a result of decisions that were made by management to no longer reach out to uh, rescues. That is the decision because they wanted to start a new or restart a foster program. I actually taught the classes for the neonates at one point. I was also told at one point that they didn't have the correct emails or when I realized that emails for, for rescues were not reaching the rescues. I did the research and correct and got a list of emails that I submitted to the management and only a couple people responded to my email in that. Um, with that said, there are other things that were brought up today like the th not having um, TNR. Well, there was a TNR vet that was doing that one day a week and he was let go regarding the panleukopenia and the wonderful treatment. I, I appreciate all the care that they've given, but I've been told by Dr. Kather that they do not treat panleukopenia, they just give support. So the fact that to come to you and say that they're treating, there's no treatment. And that was with her that she provided to us at another meeting to um, the volunteers when we were concerned about why animals continue to die at such a high rate in their kennels alone. They're not using the emergency vets and they're watching animals seize and pass away in the care. That is traumatic for... Thank you, next speaker. Hi, thank you for your time today. Um, uh, I know you're hearing a lot of information today and I don't think anybody here expects you to be experts in, in animal shelter management, um, but I'm here to tell you that this report by the shelter staff is taking you all for a fool. Um, they reported that rescue um, outcomes have decreased by 68% this year and I want you to know that that is a deliberate choice that the shelter made and continues to make every single day. At the beginning of this year, we were told right before kitten season, which they report they know has a large increase of numbers of, of intakes, they told us we were no longer needed. Um, they wanted to do it all themselves. Um, 
and we can see the outcome of that. Every single person, as soon as we were told we were no longer needed, could tell you live release rate would drop, out, uh, length of stay would increase. Uh, everything in their report, everyone who's been in shelter or rescue for more than five minutes could tell you that this was going to happen. And yet every single day they continue to not utilize this network of rescues. We didn't just dissolve, we're all still here. When we weren't needed, we went to another shelter and while their live release rate was dropping, we increased another's by 20 points to 95% and made them no kill. We're all still here, we're all still doing the work. They just have to flip the button, it's already, it all exists, like there's no reason every single day for them to continue making this decision to not utilize this network. We can reverse all of this immediately. That's all I have, thank you. Thank you, and we will now head to Zoom. Liz Holtz. There may be one other, there's one other here. Oh, okay. Hi, this is Liz, can you can we'll go after. You can go. My name is Mike Wagner, I was a uh, board member. We're gonna have the Zoom speaker, and right after she's done, you're able to talk. Thank you. Ms. Holtz? Yes, hi, thank you everyone. Uh, this is Liz Holtz, I'm a uh, cat advocate, TNR trapper, foster, a um, uh, number of different things. Um, but, but a few things that I want to bring to uh, your attention. There are a lot of things that are in question. Uh, we're being told that the reason, you know, their capacity issues is because they're taking sick and injured cats only in. And my question would be, and this is a quote from Maddie's Institute, um, a Q&A that was done in October of 2015. And the quote is this. In San Jose, California, where more than 10,000 community cats were sterilized and returned over a four-year period as part of a shelter-based community cat program, it was observed that the impounded feral cats were surprisingly healthy and had good body weight. To quote John Sticarelli, who at that time was the deputy director of SJAX, most of these cats are healthy, they're vibrant, they don't need us. All we really need to do is control their population. Now we're being told that all the animals coming in are sick. They've chosen to only take in sick and injured animals. Um, and even then, um, that's on a case by case. You need to look at everything that's going on. We were told a year ago that we were going to be given numbers of how many animals were turned away because they were only taking in sick and injured animals. And Jay Toronto said that they had been tracking it since last September. No one has ever seen these. We haven't seen any information either on the 2022 Maddie's report and it hasn't been filed. What's up? Good afternoon, my name's Mike Wagner. I was a former board member for Kittens First for three years. I was a treasurer, I became interim president. I was there from 2019 to 2022 before we dissolved our nonprofit. The founder was Dr. Tiva Hoshizaki. She was a veterinary, veterinarian here at the shelter for nearly four and a half years. We heard on June 26 from Mr. Toronto that the Pan Luke protocols were 20 years old and needed updating. That is not true. Dr. Tiva Hoshizaki, my colleague and founder of Kittens First, wrote those Pan Luke protocols. She's a neonatal specialist with a degree from Cornell Medical School. She wrote those and you're, they were last updated in February of 2021. They're not 20 years old and they were last updated to the T drive. I've submitted for the record an email from your former shelter manager, Lawrence Gomez, who also confirms that and they were uploaded to the T drive. Um, I came across the dashboard here, your public dashboard that people rely on to uh, see how the shelter's performing. I added up all the monthly kennel report data for cats dying in the care of the shelter, and lo and behold, this, this calendar year through October, cats dying in the care of the shelter was underreported on this dashboard by 23%. The public was being misled by 23%. I don't know if that was manipulated or what, but I hope that Joe Royce and his audit can get to the bottom of it. I just wanna say one thing here quickly. You've watched this shelter go from an $8.6 million budget to $12 million, up 40%, and during that time, your live release rate has collapsed from 75% to 
from 90% for cats down to 75% on lower intake numbers. This is Linguini. This cat was available for adoption. Does this cat look like it should have been available for adoption? Does it? Please tell me. Do you think this cat was available for adoption? Thank you. We have one additional speaker card submitted for Jean Dresden. You can make your way down. Jean Dresden, and I've been a volunteer uh, do it, rescuing cats primarily, taking them out of our public parks and finding them homes. I also am serving on the stakeholder committee and have been following some of the transitions as there's been a lot of changes in the shelter through the pandemic. You've been hearing about a lot of the difficulties. My colleagues have expressed them well, but one of the things you might be wondering is, but what can we do? There's so much. There's something that you could recommend today and I would ask that you do. We identified in a stakeholder meeting last week that a critical choke point in doing spay and neuter is that we do not have enough registered veterinary technicians on staff. It's, we have a job category that includes licensed professionals and unlicensed professionals, and there's no incentive to go get the license because there's no differentiation in their compensation. But there are differences in the tasks that they can do. If you don't have enough registered vet techs on staff, you can't do spay neuter surgeries or any other surgeries. The shelter is now fully staffed with veterinarians, but it can't do surgery to capacity because there are not enough registered vet techs. You could make a recommendation to the full council to move along the process and human resources to create those two job categories so that it would be easier to recruit into those two separate categories at a so there's a financial incentive for people to be registered vet techs. That's an action you can take today to help solve the problems at the shelter. Thank you. Thank you, we will head back to Zoom, caller 1367. Caller 1367. Yes, can you hear me? This is Lillian uh, yes. from District 3. I'm specifically talking to um, Omar Torres who represents my district. Uh, Mr. Torres, today we heard it from cat people, kitten people, network and rescue, what worked in the past, what hasn't. I was a dog owner. I was a cat owner. I love my cat. Um, I must tell you that when I hear that you don't have enough vet techs that could possibly do some of this work that is necessary, but your budget went from 8.6 to $12 million, you know, there's just so much that can be done. Uh, a mobile van out in the community would help low-income people to spay and neuter their animals if you had more vet techs. And that um, the uh, TNR program, which only uh, recently came back and is only one day a week, should be increased. Um, some of the other things that are happening in the shelter are so heartbreaking that at the end of the year, I'm taking that you know, back into the new year in 2024, thinking, well, I did the best that I could with my cat and I spent hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dollars on vet bills and um, kitty litter and you name it. So we love our animals. And if people in San Jose realize that so many people have been involved in trying to, to save the animals, rescue the animals, do surgery on the animals, I think they would have a, a change of heart. So if you could please bring in today, like the last person who spoke, the vet um, text that would be a great step forward. Thank you so much. Thank you. Back to the committee. Thank you. I'll call first on Councilmember Ortiz. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, first off, I, I want to thank our animal care and service team uh, for the report. It was difficult to read about the intense challenges uh, faced in our shelter, but it's important for us to know um, where we're at. I also wanna share my thanks and gratitude to our animal activists and, and volunteers who made time to be here today and share your perspective and what you've seen firsthand in, in our shelter and volunteering in our shelter. 
Uh, I know that we know it all too well. Uh, nationwide, all shelters are facing unfathom unfathomable challenges, be it retention in staff um, or the sheer volume of animals uh, being taken in. Uh, we understand that the job is not easy. And although the council made a decision to increase wages and recently retitle um, some ACS uh, classifications, there's still a lot of work for us to do to en ensure that our furry friends are, are being taken care of. My team has also seen um, this issue firsthand because we partner with the Humane Society of Silicon Valley on a monthly basis uh, to provide wellness clinics and spay and neuter services to residents of our low-income uh, census tracts. <clears throat> And I've made this collaboration a priority because I recognize that it serves our residents and, of course, our ACS staff alike. I've also added to the adoption uptick myself because I've taken in my own kitten this year, Cleopatra, with the support of the team uh, at the animal shelter. And uh, my mom named it, by the way. Uh, <laughs> that, that, be that being said, I'm alarmed at the harrowing increases of deaths that have occurred this, this past year. And likewise, I value the comments from our volunteers and advocates who share their concerns um, as well. So I do have a few questions. Um, is there a differentiated number of deaths in the shelter versus animals being euthanized? Council member, thank you for the question. Uh, as far as the number The numbers, total? yes. Yeah, are we yes. putting them together? Are they differentiated? Yes, there is a, um, uh, we do track uh, how many animals uh, by category, whether it's a dog, a puppy, a uh, cat, kitten, and uh, other domestic animal. And uh, it is reported out separately uh, from the euthanasia numbers. Okay. And additionally, we're still confirming the data, but we have also kind of uh, looked at uh, how many, uh, when we're reporting out animals that have died, that also counts animals that have died uh, at a medical emergency clinic because they're still our animals. Uh, if they died out in foster care, we do count that against our numbers. Uh, and so, but we are also looking at how many actual animals have died in the shelter and also outside of the shelter. Okay. As a follow-up to this, if a death occurs in the shelter that is not due to euthanasia, is it captured with a reason, such as condition of uh, kennel or untreated disease, et cetera? Uh, yes, so um, this was some of sort of the director duties that uh, unfortunately I wasn't able to really <laughs> chomp into because of the vet shortage. So having to be a staff veterinarian almost five days a week for the first several months when I started. As we've hired more vets, it's freed me up to go back and uh, look at data. Um, a lot of the data integrity um, had to be changed. So one of the big changes I made was to simplify things to follow the coalition matrix. So animals that uh, uh, have a, a UU condition, um, it should be captured that they came in and with a severe medical issue. And that could be anything from severe disease, uh, you know, severe advanced chronic age, emaciation, uh, trauma. And like I said, those are the animals that if we feel that they, they have a fighting chance, we do immediately institute treatment. So our staff is trained that any emergency or severely ill animal is not just put on a vet check and kenneled. It has been made very clear to them that the policy has changed and medical is now an, an open door department. If you see something, bring it to our attention. At the point when there's over 900 animals in the building, it is physically impossible for our medical staff to put eyes on the, each animal and examine each animal every day. Somebody did the math at one point and it was like, with taking no breaks, not going to the bathroom, not eating in a shift, you'd be able to look at like one animal for 10 minutes every two weeks, uh, you know, one time within a two week period. That's how many animals there were. So we do flag the ones that come in that are severely injured or sick and you know, my team, we do not make euthanasia decisions lightly, and it would be, you know, not easy, but we certainly would be justified to see some of these severe trauma, severely ill animals, and say, 
this looks bad, I'm just gonna let you go. We don't take those decisions lightly. So if we feel that we can stabilize them, address their injuries, um, sometimes they do have to be hospitalized for a few days before we can address. So looking at it from an outside perspective, it might look like, oh, they're just letting it sit here suffering, they're, they're not amputating the leg. Well, I had one recently, it had severe traumatic brain injury, so it wasn't stable for anesthesia. So yeah, I had to treat the brain injury, feed it, get it healthier. Eventually I was able to pin the leg. So we do flag those, and so on the reports that we are using the uh, Asilomar report, it reflects that the UUs, so those untreatable unhealthy, the ones that died in kennel, doesn't mean that they were ignored or neglected or, or treatment wasn't instituted. It just means that they succumb to their illness or their injury, which is across the board in human medicine, animal medicine. Doesn't mean that they were suffering. If they're in pain, they're on pain management. Can we do better sometimes? Are there some where, you know, maybe we could have done better, maybe we could have made a different decision? Absolutely. We take these home with us every single day. All these animals that die sit with us as vets, as people. This is our loss, these are our patients. It's, it's hard for us as well, but we're not just gonna euthanize them because they're sick. Does that answer your question or? Yeah, yeah, no, appreciate that. My main question was, are we recording you know, the yes, it should be captured yeah. in the data that, yeah. you know. But thank you for sharing that very yes. important information. Yeah. Councilman, if I may, I, I, I believe to answer a little bit of your question, if, if we do suspect that a, a cat or kitten uh, or a puppy, or, uh, you know, died of a, a parvo or pan luke, uh, we do test uh, to confirm to see, but unfortunately, and Dr. Kater can confirm, uh, with the number of animals that we have taken in, and I did add, pose this question to her, are we able to um, identify the cause of death for every single animal that comes into the shelter? It's, it's near impossible to do so unless it's obvious, like a trauma. Uh, even, um, and, and for quick background, I used to uh, be with our field services unit and used to investigate uh, things like poisoning. Um, and, and so in order for us to identify uh, poisoning as a cause of death, uh, it, it would have to be specific, and these are conversations that we've had with uh, UC Davis. And so there are times where we are able to tell if it's obvious, but unfortunately there are times that, uh, you know, we just are not able to find the cause. Okay, no, that, that, make, that makes sense, thank you, thank you for that. Uh, under the report, it outlines the uh, adoption, adoption metrics um, that says ACS acknowledges that rebuilding rescue partnerships is important to the overall outcome of an animal and that staff is working to increase rescue collaboration and live outcomes. Can you share some strategies that will work towards this goal? Yes, thank you for the questions. And I do wanna um, just highlight out there that we are uh, strengthening our relationship with our rescue partners. For the, um, uh, I have to look at my computer, yeah. here, but for the fiscal uh, year, we, uh, we did work with about uh, over 90 rescue partners that even though it was challenging for many, including them, we still um, work with about, uh, around 90 or more partners, uh, totaling about over a thousand animals out of the shelter. Do we have a, a great relationship with every single one of them? No, uh, I, I think that those are uh, the relationships that we wanna strengthen again. Uh, we do have partners that, you know, they're not necessarily gonna speak out publicly, but they do, you know, have sent us emails appreciating our staff and, and uh, collaborate with our team. But we do admit that we did over pivot uh, last fiscal year uh, with uh, you know increasing our adoptions and, and, and uh, foster program because I think that, that we, we, there was a need to, for us to increase our uh, foster program. Um, sorry, I, I apologize, I lost your question. No, 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 well, what strategies are you going to, the department going to implement so, to strengthen partnerships? Thank you. Uh, so we are, uh, as of this week, unless it's already been done, uh, we will send out a, a, a blind survey to uh, different partners that we have uh, to identify, um, you know, we were given out four questions uh, to identify what, what we can do as an organization to enhance and improve our ability to support rescue partners to increase uh, our working relationship with them. Uh, we're also gonna set up a meeting uh, starting in January and we're gonna do this quarterly to just continue that relationship. Uh, one of the questions is to identify what specialty animals uh, are you, because not all rescues will take uh, all animals, 
what type of animals will you take uh, healthy, what type of injuries or medical or behavior um, um, status, and additionally, what form of communication are you good at? Because sometimes they'll, they'll be on Facebook, they'll do by email or by text. So those are some of the things that we're doing. And then we definitely are open to the feedback from our uh, partners. Um, and because every single one of them has a, a, a different need that would allow us to uh, be able to support them better. Thank you. I'm out of time, but uh, I'll go again after uh, Council Member Torres. Thank you. Council Member Torres? Great. Thank you. So just like Council Member Ortiz said, this, uh, you know, the, re the report is hard to read, but it's also, as you can imagine, with all the ongoing issues that we have at our, at our shelter, right? I've been meeting with, with our staff, right? With Angel, with our activists. And so it's, it's, uh, it's unfortunately brutal to hear what's happening in our, in our shelter. And I just want, I truly want to commend our, our shelter staff. Uh, I know that there's external uh, for forces that, um, on why we're having these concerns, right? Um, but again, as you know, we all work together, we're all, we're all one team. Uh, I, I, I'm definitely committed to making sure that we address the concerns of um, our activists that we make sure that our, our furry friends are healthy and, and, and safe, right? And find a home when they do, do go through our, our, our shelter. Uh, and, you know, I'm not a cat man like, like Council Member Ortiz is. I'm, I'm a, I do love, love cats, but I'm more of a dog person. Uh, and so I have to myself, to the activist, you know, I, I'm also a, a, a furry lover. I have, uh, my, little, my little boy is uh, Lenny and my little girl is Bonet. And uh, you know, if you get it, I'm a huge Lenny Kravitz fan, so that's why his name is Lenny and his partner's wife is named Bonet, for Lisa Bonet. So, but anyways, um, you know, those are my dogs and I love them to death. And so when I hear our activists with their concerns, right, it, it also, it, it pains me because I, I don't, I don't wanna see other, uh, other animals uh, in pain or, or dying. Uh, and so when I see that number, 1,072, I know that's a lot, right? Uh, but I know there's many reasons why these dogs and these kitties and these other animals have to get uh, euthanized. So I, I thank you for answering because that was one of my questions, but Council Member Ortiz answered it. But for me, it's a little bit more of the process uh, with, when it comes to euthanization and or death. Uh, so when the shelter receives a, an animal that's... Uh, has an untreatable disease or injury, um, is it euthanized or tracked as a, is it tracked as a, when it's euthanized, uh, is it tracked as euthanization or tracked as a death? Thank you for the question. So when an animal comes in, it, it is, um, depending on the condition it's coming in, it, it will be uh, Put, uh, added in our system. So if an animal has a severe injury and it's euthanized, then it will be tracked in the system as euthan euthanasia. Uh, if it was uh, uh, placed in a kennel or a cage and it was being um, medically uh, looked at or observed and it unfortunately passes away, then that will be counted as uh, animals that died uh, in a kennel. Okay. Uh, th thank you. Thank you for that, that answer. And then the other one is... Uh, meeting with some of the uh, some of the activists or volunteers, they have expressed that uh, there have been removal of medical notes uh, that are no longer uh, visible to um, rescues, volunteers, and potential adopters. Is there a reason why we why why we got rid of uh, the medical notes? I believe you're talking about the reference to the public access to where public notes are the medical notes. I believe so, yes. Yeah. Sorry, sorry, Matt, yes. So part of it was there's a, there was a changeover in terms of technology of how we're sharing information to the public, and that changeover, and then also the lack of veterinary care at the time, we, there's, there's been a transition. There's an increase now of medical notes out there in terms of for public consumption. Uh, if you look at our pet compass, you can click on an animal, and you can see if there's any medical notes 
the staff has to take those things from the internal system and put them on the web notes so that people can see them. And we're endeavoring to make them more clear, more readable, and more understandable to the average person, but also um, educational to those who want to rescue or who might need to know what level of care they're going to need to provide. It's an imperfect thing because it's less of push and pull and it's this kind of continuum. Um, and again, when we have massive volumes of, of animals, it's hard to get all of the notes as thorough as possible to the public side. And so there's that push and pull to make it happen. There's no intention to try to withhold to be obscuring, it, if that's the kind of message there. It, it, we're endeavoring to be as transparent and as clear of what we understand about the animal as possible so that those, so that that animal finds the best possible outcome. Animal services, animal care and services is that bridge. We need to find where that live outcome is as best we can. And it, it might be to a rescue, it might be to an adoption, it might be to know that someone else. And so, again, we're endeavoring to make those things as clear as we can. Okay. So I, I ask because uh, if, if, and I know that we also, have volunteers, right? Medical volunteers, right? And so I, I asked, so if a medical volunteer needs to know that a, a furry animal is in need, um, they, they know, right? Internally, they know that this animal is, is, is sick and, and we, you know, needs care. Because I think that's what their, their concern was, that, you know, that the, they don't know whether it is or not. Thank you, council member. So one of the, I would call it, just call it stage one for now, in our ability to uh, have a two-way communication with our uh, staff and volunteers. We, we did uh, kind of tweak uh, or improved our uh, QR code system, so anyone, uh, actually including the, the public, can scan the QR code and put their observation. We were having some communication um, challenges, and so now, uh, oh, I don't want to bore you with how we got here, but I, now we're at the point where we're able to do a two-way communication. It is still not a perfect system because, I, as you uh, heard earlier, we do want to be able to provide some sort of feedback uh, to, to the staff or volunteer uh, unless they go into our system, mm -hmm. which volunteers uh, are not able to, uh, to see an update on the treatment. Uh, staff are able to do so, but volunteers don't have that. So that is something that uh, we're con constantly uh, working with our IT team on how we can improve the, the response because I do want them uh, and that's the reason why we wanted a two-way communication because previously it was just one way right but now uh, I've, I've you know, the team has been um, uh, very dedicated in being at least able to respond to say hey we, we have your um, um, uh, observation and we are putting it on vet check so vet check then uh, goes on a list that the medical team looks at and then um, uh, they, they'll uh, look at to see what the complaint is and addresses it. But what we want to be able to do moving forward uh, and, and how we can, we'd have to discuss this internally, but I do want to be able to uh, be able to respond and say, hey, thank you for, uh, and I've seen some of those emails, but it's not consistent. Thank you for your observation. Uh, we placed it on uh, medication or this is, you know, what's going on with the animal. But some of these animals do need constant uh, care. And so I'm, I'm, that's the part where I just don't know how often we're going to be able to do that with the number of animals at the shelter. Somebody will have to physically go back into that email and, and, and respond to that. So again, that's something that I, I had a recent conversation with our IT team uh, earlier today before this presentation to see how we can kind of, uh, make things a little bit more seamless and, and, and uh, more uh, be able to communicate back to the person uh, putting in the complaint. Okay, thank you, uh, thank you for that. And then I, I did send you all some questions and we can, we can follow up offline. Uh, but I'm, I'm asking a couple of questions from some of the members in the public because I believe that these are important, right? Um, for me, it's concerning when I hear that we are not reaching out to rescue groups. So I know a few of them did mention that. Is there a reason why we stopped communicating with rescue groups or working with rescue groups uh, at the shelter? Thank you for the question. We, um, we work with about 90, over 90 rescue groups in this last fiscal year. The number of animals that have gone to rescue has significantly gone down. Um, are there rescue partners out there that we need to strengthen our relationship and re and, 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 and re-engage? Yes. Um, and at the same time, we, we do admit that we over-pivoted because I think after we received a consultation, our understanding was uh, that um, we were getting the message that there was, we need to balance out our live outcome. And so we unfortunately over-pivoted to concentrating on um, 
the foster program and the adoption. And as you can see, there's an increase in our adoption and, and foster. Um, and, and it's not a final outcome, but it's at least a temporary uh, placement outside of the shelter is the reason why we really wanted to focus on the foster program. As you can imagine, with the number of animals that are coming in the shelter, we definitely want to uh, alleviate the, the, the population. So we, we're uh, trying to identify these uh, partners that we uh, need to strengthen our, our relationships with, and that's why we are wanting to really re-engage and start meeting with them. And, and really refocus on making sure because, you know, with all the challenges that you've, you've heard, <clears throat> the shelter is one part of the solution. It, it does require the rescue partners, other shelters, and also the community. But I think there's a wider scale of being able to provide low cost pay neuter vaccination to low income or people mm -hmm. that really are not able to afford vet care. And so I think that that is ultimately one of our goals moving forward, but it's gonna, it's gonna take us a while to, to get to where we need to be. Great, and thank you, and I think, thank you for that. And, and this is the, the last question is for An Angel, because I'm actually running out of time, because uh, you know, this is a great concern. Uh, I, Jean, Jean just mentioned that there's a stakeholders meeting. I don't know if that is, a, a, do, does the city run a city, does the city have their, our, our own task force or a working group with activists and volunteers and, and, and rescue groups when it comes to the shelter? Yeah, Council Member, Angel Reels, Deputy City Manager. Um, what Jim was referring to is a, uh, a, an interim CAT working group that we've put together in, in the meantime. We, we have put a pause on our broader stakeholder meetings because I think we need to reconfigure that body to make it more effective. Um, but we have been meeting as a uh, small subcommittee focused specifically on cats. And in that conversation, we, we, it was a, a conversation with rescues, with volunteers, with a number, with kind of with the cross section of cat um, uh, enthusiasts and activists. Um, and one of the things that came up in that conversation is the need for uh, more vet techs, right? For surgery, right? Because a year ago, the problem we were having was getting more vets. The good news here is that a year later, we have, now we're, we're, we're maxed out in terms of our vet, so that's, a, that's good progress. The second piece that that triggers now is assistance for the vets, because if we're gonna get a real good handle on this, both short-term and long-term, we're gonna need to increase spay and neuter and put a strong emphasis on TNR, trap, neuter, and release. And uh, internally, we've been talking uh, as, as a group, uh, we will, you, you'll see us come forward. I don't wanna get ahead of ourselves in terms of the budget, but as we're dialing in on really resolving kind of the key pain points, uh, we've identified the need to invest more in that area. So you'll, you will see more during the budget process around that. Okay, and, and I think this is a question to, to, to our, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, in, the, in the motion, so for me, I think it's, it's it, I know, and we all love cats, but for me, I think it's particularly important that we, we restart that working group or task force for all of our furry friends. Right, so I don't know if, I, if we could make that in, in the motion or, or we would have to submit a blue memo when it comes to, when we cross-reference it in January. Yeah, so. let's cross-reference it to the full council and, and, then we can put it and in add to that agenda item that um, there may be specific actions for recommendations. Okay. If I could help, I don't know that we need direction to do that because we're going to do yeah, it we, anyways. That, so we are going to begin reforming. Sorry, Matt, you're, you're not connected to the... I mean, you are, but you're not close enough to the mic. I, I can't hear you. I'm sorry. I don't know that we need direction to do that, what you're saying, because we're going to do it anyways. And so, okay. so as Angel said, we are, that, the larger group was paused just briefly so that we could focus on what, what the current issue was so we can gear up for kitten season starting up in the next year. So there's some specific actions there that we needed to do. And then as he's reconfiguring, we'll re-engage the, the broader groups as well, for sure. And that's going to be happening in the next month or so anyway. So, Cross-reference, if you will, get direction, if you will, but that's going to happen right. regardless. I, I, I don't want to filibuster the meeting, but for me, as a, a newly elected official or freshman council member, I should say, uh, well, sophomore now at this point, right, second year, um, but uh, as a freshman council member, uh, we've always been told that it, that that we should propose a policy memo or propose a blue memo so it can be in writing. Right, I think yeah. verbally, I know that our, our council, our, 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 our activists, right, love to hear it verbally, but I think if it's set in stone mm -hmm. um, or etched in a memo, that it's uh, better for all of us to, to be on the same page when it comes to 
uh, dealing with our furry friends. That's right. Oh. It just it just provides documentation. Yeah, great. Thank you all for. Did you want to make that motion? That that we accept the we accept the report and we're going to cross reference it for uh, review and action to the full council. Yes. Second. So moved. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, if I could just say one thing on top of what Angel just said in regards to Jean's question about the animal health technicians, you all took action on November 28th to create that new classification. It went to Civil Service Commission, I think, a week or so ago. So those positions are now in place with some HR machinations going on behind the scenes, and we'll be recruiting on those positions with different compensation for the licensed and unlicensed AHTs. Perfect. So that already happened. Yes. Yeah, that's correct. Okay, Already thank done. you. Um, for those of you who don't know, we have long consent item calendars and I don't always remember every single thing that we've voted on. We vote on a lot of things. I hope my colleagues will uh, indulge me. I have a couple of, of things that have come up since uh, in, from Council Member Torres's comments. So I just wanna, I just wanna, uh, I think we've been kind of talking about this, but I just wanna lay it out. There was a specific change in the way the shelter did their operations, and it was based on Maddie's fund. Did I get that correct? Correct. Thank you for the question. If uh, specifically for which? Um, in in not um, in not going to to say animals need rescue immediately, and not going to the rescues. As much you if, said, you've said a couple of times we over pivoted, and I've heard from the now we heard, we've heard a lot from the the groups that that the rescue partnerships there were some of them that have just atrophied is is what it kind of sounded like, and so especially at kitten season, I, we are new kitten owners in my house. We've had dogs before. We have one dog now and one kitten. She went into heat at five months. We haven't been able to spay her yet. Like that was a shock to us last week, by the way. Um, so the, the fact that kittens can have kittens like freaked me out. And I know you guys are all laughing because you're all cat people and already knew this, but Gina almost called you. <laughs> we were freaking out. Um, but so, so the comment of, you know, they told us at the beginning of kitten season, they didn't need us. I mean, wasn't there a point during when, when TNR had to be suspended, that there was some idea that maybe we had done the wrong thing and we should change immediately? I'm, I'm curious, like, how, how, did, how did we get to where we are? I, I think one of the, you know, during the recommendations, uh, we, we were addressing, really, the goal of every shelter is to get an animal out alive. That is, that is the goal, how, however that goal is achieved. When, when I say over pivoted is I think we over focused on adoptions in the foster program, which is not a small feat in itself, but I think that we, when I say over pivoted is that we, we should have balanced out our uh, concentration and our operation to ensure that we continue to uh, also um, have the same balance of animals that are going out to our rescue partners. And that's why, um, you know, moving forward, we want to make sure that we strengthen that relationship uh, because we, when I say over pivoted, we, we, lack of a better word, neglected the outcomes to rescues uh, in a way that it decreased that number. Um, and I think, but, but part of the, the challenge also is with the lack of veterinarians, um, I think that there's the resources out there for spay and neuter uh, really, and not just with us, but with, with uh, private organizations or an increasing uh, cost of vet care. There was also a challenge for some because many um, depended on us to be able to do a high volume, uh, high and spay neuter services so that when we have these animals uh, sterilized, then uh, a rescue or uh, partner um, is able to pull because you know we're not, we're not charging for those services as to where if somebody was to go somewhere else, they, they, they're gonna pay uh, 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 X amount of dollars. And so I think that is one of the reasons why we did not get a lot of outcomes also uh, on top of the relationships uh, is because we were not able to consistently have uh, our spay neuter program uh, available. I think the general logic was, from Maddie's group, was you were over-reliant 
on rescues, not that you shouldn't rely on rescues. And in our pivot to look at the, so if the population is, to get your animals out, is over-reliant on rescues, which is a finite group, and look at your community at writ large, which is a million, north of a million people, to have a bigger capacity, so you should have a bigger adoption number now than you have. And so then we were trying to pivot to having more adoptions so that the bigger population of San Jose area, that's the logic behind it. And that's why we, so it was, we're over-reliant on rescues is the logic that was provided to us by, from Maddie's. And so when we say we're looking for more capacity at the adoption level, that's the over pivot. And so like, we shouldn't have pivoted as hard as we did so that, and if the communication came out from any of our staff that we do not want rescues to participate with us, that's a false notion. If that came out of us, I apologize that that's the case. That's not our intention. They are a critical part of, again, I look at it as bridges. Every animal has a bridge out of our shelter. And I, I, sometimes rescues are so much better at, for the live outcome for the animal than it would be for an adoption. They have so many more resources. Sometimes they can provide that culture, a cultured care that that critical animal needs that an adoption is just inappropriate. Um, and so that they have so many more specialties, sometimes it's just a, a bunch of different things. And so if that message came out from us, I'll apologize for that. That's not the intention by any stretch. But again, that, that's what you say, we over pivoted. It was that to build a bigger capacity and have more adoptions, not completely pivot against something. Thank you. So I would just like to make sure I understand. It was said in the, in the presentation and it's said in the, in the report and it's underneath the, the TNR public spay and neuter five-year trends and the number for 22-23 is right around 1,000, it's 1,200 something, and the year before 21-22 was over 3,700. And underneath that, there's two sentences that I wanna read because I, I still am not, I just don't understand, um, and I want to understand and make sure we're all we all share the same understanding about what exactly happened and why and how we're gonna make it better. Uh, based on recommendations from Maddie's Fund and in an effort to slow the flow of animals into the shelter, staff prioritized the intake of sick, injured, and aggressive animals, which also contributed to the decrease in overall intake. Healthy animals were taken in on a case-by-case -case basis when staffing resources and space were available. And I wanna be, I wanna be clear, I, I know you all love animals and I know you all love animals and I know that the work that the, the shelter does is, is very important and, and I can tell that you're a vet who, I, I also know the high suicide rate of vets because I have a close friend who, who is a vet. I know it's a very emotionally fraught, but I don't, what I don't understand is why, when I heard from, when there were sick animals before, um, and I don't know if it was before the pandemic or what, I, they were put on a needs rescue immediately list so that you, you were triaging and, and probably it wasn't you because you weren't here, but you were triaging at this shelter and then they were being asked for rescue so we could, you could focus on triaging and spay and neuter and the rescue groups could could take individual animals and get them across the finish line hopefully hopefully to get better it sounds like that changed and sick animals were are being kept in the shelter for you to not only triage but also to treat is that what is happening or what was happening before we decided to re-pivot after we pivot. Yes, thank you. So um, there, there was word going around when I started that I didn't like working with rescues. I don't know where that narrative ever came from. I've never, it's never been on our website, it's never been on social media, it's never come out of my mouth. Um, this was one of the reasons that I, you know, I finally found time to sit down with um, our cat volunteers and, and you know, explain to them, I, I need rescue. We, we were reaching out. Um, from my perspective, you know, we have two shelter operations supervisors, one who when she started, that was her main task was network, 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 contact rescues. We're really trying to push them, um, I think as Jay touched on, 
So maybe two main areas where they can look. We don't have the time or the resources. Oh, this person likes to be phone called. This person's like a handwritten letter in the mail. This person likes to be emailed. This person likes Facebook. This person likes. So okay. we're trying to really educate the rescue groups to to use this new compass, the centralized system, mm -hmm. where they can easily easily sort by cat, dog, if it needs rescue, whether it's urgent, final, or non-urgent, and. There are many, many medical animals that I've put on needs rescue. Right now, I just looked, we have 36. Um, I think I have uh, maybe 10 medical. Uh, I put cats on that need their eyes removed where we were, we were backlogged with surgery. And I said, I don't, I don't have time for this. Like, right. they're comfortable with it right now, but it was a whole litter where at least one out of, yeah. cat, out of every litter needed one or two eyes removed. I put it on needs at rescue. I put it on urgent. I put notes in. They're networking. You can see the emails that are being sent. Those cats sat and sat until I was forced. My team had to finally take, remove their eyes. Okay. And I'm seeing this repeatedly where I okay. am asking. I am putting medical. Okay. Um, they're just not, not leaving. And so we are forced then to provide that medical care. We can't okay. ignore them. Um, I don't know what other better way, but like I said, just trying to really use that pet compass because we're, we're putting the notes in there. Okay. Um, you know, we have a, a cat with kidney failure that I said it's on final. This is just too much. This is a chronic, she can live for years, but this is not something that the shelter can just maintain. Right. She, okay. She, she, they don't get pulled and it's, it's hard and it's That's frustrating. Helpful. But so it's, you, so you, ideally you would like to triage and do TNR, spay neuter. You're having to treat because there isn't enough there aren't enough resources in the community to take, to yes, take, and we were is, told that, early, is that a fair assessment? Yes, we were told early in the year too, the rescues were full, which I totally understand, just as shelters are full, rescues are full. They said, we don't have any foster okay. homes, we can't pull right now. We, at, at kitten season again, we started to come up as the kittens just started pouring in and bins were filling with bottle babies. We said, hey, how about let's just create like a, a open house shopping hour for rescues. We'll, we'll dedicate like between nine and 10. You guys can just come in, you can take whatever you want. Healthy ones, sick ones, just we, we need you to just start lowering this number because if we start overcrowding with our most susceptible population with, a ki with <laughs> kittens, that's where you're gonna see disease spread. Mm -hmm. So we tried this open house hour. It wasn't very successful. So there has been a lot of brainstorming and, and trying different ways to, to work with these rescues to, to take our animals. Um, and I, I don't know what, what the solution is. Okay. If, if I can add, I, I think that's one of our uh, strategies moving forward is reaching out to these partners early. And I think that we, what had happened was that we started to reach out to them when it was too late. And so when they were full, when they were not able to uh, take in more animals, which uh, again, it, everybody has that uh, challenge. So I think that's why we want to re-engage uh, and, and communicate early on to see how we can um, uh, improve our ability to, to work with our partners and increase our ability to uh, have animals go out to rescues. Okay, and I have one final question. I want to thank you, Council Member Kandilis. Um What happens then with the healthy animals if they're not taken in? It says One, healthy animals are taken in on a case-by-case -case basis. So, and regard and staff and space staff and space. So, what happens with healthy animals that are turned away? So and I how know often there was, does that happen? So, um, I have just the numbers from February that the staff have been tracking. And again, I don't know how consistent we've been able to track animals that have been turned away. But total since February up until December. Uh, under 500 animals, dogs, cats, and others, have been turned away. I think one of our, um, I believe we still take, um, uh, took in um, maybe around seven to 8,000 animals over the counter. Um, we, our staff does try to uh, divert an animal when the shelter is at capacity, because when the shelter is at capacity, our responsibility to these animals is not to go beyond our capacity for care. That is the biggest concern that we have. And so we do try to work with our community and try to divert these animals. But unfortunately, if, if there is a, a challenge, we always ask the staff to talk to a supervisor to see if we can still take that animal in. Uh, we're not able to take all the animals in, but if they're healthy 
and friendly, we do try to encourage the community to hold on to them and, and have some sort of an incentive for them to, to continue to, to do that. But, um, you know, we have taken some in, and unfortunately there are some that we have uh, turned away. Uh, but we haven't 100% turned away every single healthy, friendly animal. Understood. Yeah, th Matt? that was for a period of the year that we were turning away healthy animals, and that was just because of the capacity. That, that was the period of the year, and so we were trying to give potentially to look at other resources. Can you hold on to the animal for a few days if it's healthy? We do have food and so, some for, sorts of resources that we provide. Again, it's not a perfect system by any stretch, but it's certainly, and also it's like if we just deflect them to other rescues, or, or to, sorry, to other shelters, they're probably in the same boat too. So it's, can you hang on to it? Can you come back in a few days and see if we can, see if we have space for it? Like right now, we're not as full as we were back then. We're sort of heavy on the dog side right now, but not on the cats. And so the, right, those, that communication to the public is, is not there now. Okay, thank you. I'd like to add something to this. I'm a data nerd. And um, as uh, uh, our director, uh, Deputy Director Jay Tirado said, we really try to work with people. We never tell people, um, uh, you know, basically you're on your own. We beg, <laughs> what um, supplies can we provide? Can you do a found report? But being the uh, data nerd, and it was in the Maddie's report that our redemption rate for cats is 2%. So people bring us cats that they find. They think that it's a stray cat. Nobody's coming to look for their cats in the shelter. Very few of them find them. And most of the time, these cats find their own way home. So if we're able to convince them that the cat looks healthy, you can keep an eye on them. Are you able? Do you feel comfortable with this? If people are dead set against it, then we'll work and find place to be able um, to take it in. And this is really important with uh, neonates when we're getting in underaged kittens because almost all the times the moms are there. They're maybe mm -hmm. hiding. So a lot of times it's working with people to say, okay, um, are you able to care for them for a certain period of time? But again, if they're, they, they don't have any resources, they don't have the capacity, then we figure it out. Um, but uh, just put it out there. If you find a neo, neonates mom and they're healthy, I mean, they look like they're fed, bellies are, are full, mom is uh, probably uh, out there. And if we just take in the neonates, like you were just saying, in a matter of weeks, mom's going to get pregnant again, and we're back in the same position. Yep. All right, thank you. Councilmember Candelas. Thank you, Chairwoman Davis. I, th th those are all great points, and and I, I'm uh, thank you, um, um, Director Loesch, for for that um, uh, reminder on the on the vet text. I know that's one of the the questions that I had as a follow up from public comments. I know in the last uh, couple of weeks, my office has received several uh, correspondence from from folks who are obviously very vested in ensuring that we are doing everything we can as a city to be operating. Um, um, an animal shelter that um, that is not only providing for for our, uh, our our dogs and our and our rabbits, but also for for our cats, and do it in, in a compassionate way. And 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 I guess a couple questions that I have. One is, um, I know we stopped our TNR uh, program, and we we're just res resuming it. And and there's there's been a couple uh, notes that I received this. So our hope to where we want to go with our TNR rates. So do, we, do we have an idea of what our metric is to where we want to get and how are we going to get there? My goal is to have the back clinic, the shelter clinic, running surgery five days a week and the front uh, spay neuter clinic back up to five days a week. Uh, the amount of extra staff we need uh, is pretty significant to allow that to happen. Our animal health technicians and new ACA's assistants, <laughs> um, their only job is not to support with surgery. So we have uh, AHTs assigned to doing the intake vaccines and health checks for every animal that comes through the door during kitten season. We have one assigned all day to monitor the medical text line, schedule appointments, triage, send home medications. We have ones doing walkthrough. We have ones doing booster vaccines. So they're spread throughout the shelter. So to have a functional high volume clinic requires a minimum of one veterinarian, a registered vet technician, and two to three support uh, assistants. And we don't have those numbers, but that is my goal is where I see us going is to be able to do TNR four or five days a week um, 
and to bump up those numbers as my other vets get more proficient. Um, I've been doing this a long time, so I don't expect them to be the numbers that I was at, but ideally 20 to 30, five days a week, um, is the long-term goal if we can get the support staff. Yeah, and, and thank you, thank you for that. And so I, I know there's organizations like PAWS, right, that they, they, they I partnered with them to do a, a mobile vaccination or a mobile uh, auxiliary services in the community, so bring, Bring them to, you know, for example, Walsh Park, who's historically disadvantaged and under-resourced. So what kind of partnerships are we looking at? So the second part of my question is what strategies are we looking to make sure that we get to that goal? Because I'm, I'm, I'm a glass half full type of person by nature, so that's, I'm glad, but what are we doing to get there? Thank you for the question. When we identified our challenges when it comes to our internal uh, operation and ability to um, continue our TNR, uh, we actually work with the, our uh, admin team and program manager to uh, increase our external, uh, which we, we, we've never done before, We our external contracts. Uh, we have contracts uh, with SNPBUS, um, Nine Lives. We just recently uh, have a contract with uh, um, uh, another organization on Livermore Air, Pleasanton. Uh, we are also working on a couple of other contracts in addition to continuing conversation with PAW uh, because some of these contracts, you know, they do require budget, they do, there, there's some, some logistics behind it. But I think that that, that has been our commitment to the, the, the external resources and we will continue to explore that. Additionally, like Dr. Kather said, you know, uh, I, I think our goal, if you're going to have a number, is, is to really resume back to where we were. Uh, as an organization, around four to five thousand uh, surgeries uh, in a year, and that is kind of like the, the the number that we're looking at. But between internal internal resources and expanding them and enhancing them, and also external resources within budget, and uh, our ability to get those done is really our our um, our, our some of our strategies. And again, uh, we also have. Uh, uh, partnership with with other organizations such as the Humane Society that we're also looking at to see if we can uh, um, uh, uh, get more ability and assistance for uh, for a spay neuter. So well, we're looking at every single uh, ability uh, and resources to to really continue our um, our program. But it's it's not the easiest right now with the shortage of vets. Um, those organizations do have challenges as well, and so. Um, uh, and so that is something that we're going to continue to explore. Thank you. Um, and okay, so um, I'm, I'm optimistic we, we do have that audit underway and, and so I'm hoping that there are some strong recommendations within that audit that helps us, um, you know, move, move the issue forward and, and you know, I, I, I will um, uh, be looking, looking forward to, to whatever that reveals and, and I, I appreciate the time and I also want to thank the folks who actually came out today to to voice your concerns and also send my office correspondence. That, that's something that I don't take lightly. And neither, I'm sure neither nobody on this committee nor the council uh, does it either. So um, with that, I'll yield the rest of my time. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Dewan. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> Thank you, staff um, at the animal care services. I know that is an incredible tough job that you guys having, especially through COVID and the continued climb of um, abandoned animals, if you will. I want to also thank you, the public, for participating and, and care about our, our animals. I do have a few questions. <clears throat> Would you please clarify the vacancy of the remaining 41 budgeted uh, position the, at this point? 41 positions, are you referring to in the shelter staff or in the entire operation, which I think is closer to 90 FTEs in the entire operation? Which which part of the operation are you referring to? Uh, in the shelter staff. In the shelter staff, I believe we have 41 full-time FTEs equivalent for shelter operations. The uh, we, I believe we have a few vacant animal care attendants, and I believe we have, uh, we're now hiring for our night shift animal care attendants. Those, Interviews are just starting now. The shelter coordinators for at night are also, we hired some and not others. So there's probably a grand total of about 10 to 12 vacancies in shelter operations right now. And are we reaching out to the community for recruitment of these positions? 
Are we reaching out? Oh, absolutely, yes. And so we use our traditional channels, but then we get to specialized uh, operations like the AHTs or their vets that we go through multiple areas to get, to get people to participate in those recruitments, yes. I know in the past, uh, the shelter worked pretty closely with all the rescue group. Is there a, a reason why there's a reluctancy to, to accept help now from the, some of these uh, rescue groups? There's not a reason and there's not a reluctance. Okay. And um, was there anything that led to these partnership kind of a little bit? Yeah, I think so. It's like with everything I've observed in the animal shelter world that there's many things that are going on, not just one. As Jay noted in his presentation and in his comments that Maddie's recommendation came in and said you were over-reliant on rescues. You need to have a better balance in having terms of adoptions and relying on the public. And in doing that, we focused a lot on adoptions this year and not as much as we should have on rescue partnerships. And so that's what his comments were, we over pivoted. Not that we didn't, because we still had thousands of animals go out to rescues and continue to. I mean, heck, we had 51 animals go out of the shelter just yesterday alone. It wasn't just to adoptions, it was to rescues and transfers and everything else. 51 just yesterday. So um, it, there, there's definitively more we can do and there is more that we will be doing. All right, that's all I have, thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Ortiz. All right, thank you. I'll make this quick. Got one last question. Thank you for hearing all of our concerns. As it relates to licensing fees, um, is there a breakdown of where these are being collected from, whether it's city, zip code, um, et cetera? Thank you for the question, Councilmember. Uh, we do have data. Uh, whether it's uh, by zip code, council district, or uh, uh, census tract. And so, you know, with the, with the current environment, uh, you know, our initial goal with getting that dashboard uh, done was to uh, enhance and, and improve our marketing and compliance in certain areas that we feel like uh, we can um, increase our license compliance. But unfortunately, you know, we do have uh, some um, pet owners that are not able to uh, afford licensing right now, and that, that is a conversation that we have uh, as a city, is, is what do we do moving forward? But uh, license compliance is um, um, something that we want to improve. Okay, thank you. During the budget process, I uh, requested an MBA to look at waiving licensing fees for low-income residents, and I, I think having that breakdown will clarify the viability of this initiative. Thank you, I appreciate Staff time, appreciate uh, the community's time. Yeah, uh, yeah ch Chair and Council members, you know, just uh, I, I want to kind of direct you to page 19 uh, because when we talk about next steps and where we're going, I, I, I want to make it real clear that we do have a strategy and a path forward, right? I also want to acknowledge that we're not out of the woods yet. We are still working our way out of a very tough, complex situation, right? Um, and, and I, and I want to start by, by saying thank you not only to this team here, but also to the frontline staff at the shelter, because I will tell you this, they come to work every day and, and have one, probably one of the toughest jobs in our city. Uh, and, and at the same time with all the conversation that happens around, they're not exempt from it and they're doing their best and they, they have also come under a, a lot of harsh criticism, some of it deservedly, so, deserving some of it. Uh, really out of line and and so I just want to really acknowledge our frontline staff that have done really I think a, a heroic job in this effort and also acknowledge the complexity of this problem um, in terms of our, our, our public comment today we welcome the feedback and the leadership that we're getting from our partners right we're, we're not you know bearing our heads in the sand and saying, well you know you have a different opinion but I will say this, that if we're going to make progress going forward, we're going to also need to renegotiate the way we work together. It can't be that, you know, we're on good terms if, you, if we agree with what you say and then we're on bad terms if, we, if you disagree. We're going to have to kind of hit the refresh button and renegotiate the way we work together because I think we have the same common goals in mind. We may not agree on the process or on the path, but I think if we get to there, and, and, and everybody has my commitment that our team will lean forward in that, in that spirit. You know, if you just take a look, and I'll just kind of, uh, you know, point to two things. If we just took two major actions, right, in terms of 
you know, fully funding spay and neuter with an emphasis on TNR, and you'd take a look at those numbers, that would make a significant dent in terms of our live outcome rate. That'll also address a lot of the issues around how we work with our, with our rescues. The other one around unhealthy and untreatable intake, that's not a false narrative or an anecdote. You know, we're, hover we're hovering at 16%, uh, the highest percentage that we've ever experienced, right? We can't ignore those numbers. That's not anecdote, that's data, right? And we can't ignore that. And so I think if we, if we kind of hone in on those efforts, if you, if you look at page 19 in this memo, you'll see eight strategies that we've mm -hmm. laid out, eight areas of focus. At the top of that list is rebuilding, rebalancing, and strengthening relationships with rescue and shelter partners. We acknowledge 100% that we can't do this without rescue partners. We also ha have to acknowledge that we also need to continue to do adoptions before it was an either or. We need both, right? And I know that's a more difficult conversation to have, but we need to have both and we need to fully fund and support both of those. Couple things I wanna also point out that we have, we, we've been working out through the CAT subcommittee group is that we're looking at, at the first part of the year next year of rolling out some pilot grants that, that could go to our rescue partners in the, in, with the incentive of helping to offset some of the costs that they incur because this is also very expensive for them, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so we, we're gonna be rolling those out, working with our rescue partners. Uh, we're we're kind of modeling the Beautify SJ grants, uh, but we'll be doing that. These would be pilot grants made available to our rescue partners. We think that that's gonna help us move things forward. Uh, in addition to that, we're also exploring the possibility, this isn't a done deal yet, exploring the possibility of identifying one, maybe two temp U positions where we could bring in uh, folks that have real strong relationships with rescues and serve as that bridge that Matt was talking about between the shelter and our rescue partners as we rebuild these relationships. Uh, and we think that those two uh, strategies will also help. It's not the panacea, but I think it'll help. But I wanna point you to, those, to these eight because if you look at those eight strategies and if we stay focused to these strategies and we, and, and we, we give ourselves enough grace to kind of have the, the, the tough conversations but also give it the time that it needs, then I think we'll end up in a good place. And I don't think we're very far off. Uh, but if we could kind of move from the noise to action, I think we'll be in a better place. And so I just want to assure you all and I want to assure the, 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 the public that uh, it's not, we're, we're not just admiring the problem, we're leaning forward in a huge way. But uh, I just wanted to put some context to that. Thank you, and I appreciate the attention um, from the city manager's office on this issue, and I know Jennifer and you have spent a lot of time on this, and, and that's really important. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we're ready for the vote. Are you guys able to see that? Mm -mm. Okay. Did you want to take a verbal vote? Yeah, we'll just say all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, motion carries. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. And thank you to all the volunteers as well. We are moving on to item D2. This is uh, the community plan to end homelessness 20 to 2020 to 2025 San Jose report. And Deputy City Manager Omar Passens and group will be coming up. Good, uh, what is this? Afternoon, uh, Chair Davis and members of the committee. My name is Omar Passens. I'm uh, Deputy City Manager for Homelessness for the, the city of uh, the city, and I'm joined by uh, Nancy Klein, Director of the Office of Economic Development and Cultural Affairs, Carla Alvarez um, with our um, city library, Rosalind uh, Huey, who is both the Deputy City Manager and our Acting Housing Director, and John Cicerelli, the Director of Parks, Recreation, and Neighborhood Services. We're here today to present the City of San Jose's implementation plan for the Santa Clara County Regional Community Plan to End Homelessness. 
the community plan is a regional agreement that san jose along with all of the other cities in santa clara county our regional partners at the county nonprofit organizations members of the labor community businesses and others uh, uh, especially and including those with lived experience of homelessness came together in 2020 to adopt to drive shared regional action to address homelessness as part of that agreement, San Jose committed to developing an implementation plan for how we would do our part to achieve the goals of the community plan. The city's implementation plan is organized around the three strategies contained in the community plan, shown on this slide, and calls on the city's 22 departments and offices to identify commitments within their bodies of work to prevent and end homelessness and to manage the impacts of the crisis across the city. The implementation plan is, is designed both to clarify the efforts the city will undertake and to provide a clear mechanism for accountability, continuous learning, and reporting progress on addressing homelessness in the city. One important aspect of the city's implementation plan is that it recognizes that a city's role in addressing homelessness is broad. It starts with a range of efforts to prevent and end homelessness, but it does not stop there. Cities have obligations to foster healthy neighborhoods, to ensure open and welcoming public spaces, to keep communities safe, and many other roles that apply to unhoused members of the community, as well as people in homes, business owners, and to preserve and protect the environment. To that end, the vision offered in this implementation plan, a San Jose for everyone, is intended to reflect this obligation to everyone within our city. We must end suffering on the street by continuing to expand permanent housing options, by expanding temporary housing, and by creating better alternatives while people are on the street that provide for basic needs such as hygiene and connection to the support system. We must share and protect public spaces, both by making public spaces like libraries and parks welcoming to all residents and by preserving San Jose's natural resources such as its waterways from environmental damage. We must expect cleanliness of each other, which includes holding homeowners and small businesses accountable for dumping waste into encampment locations and holding people experiencing homelessness accountable to use the resources for trash disposal the city funds and makes available, among other efforts. And finally, we must create opportunity for every member of the community to thrive, not merely to survive, by expanding workforce and inclusive economic opportunities that can raise the floor for our residents and increase affordability across the city. Now I'd like to turn it over to my colleagues to provide a brief overview of highlights of actions of the four key departments are taking to address these pillars in line with the community plan, starting with the housing department. Rosalind? Thank you, Omar. The housing department is an essential building block of the city's approach to homelessness. Ending homelessness involves increasing permanent affordable housing options, and the housing department has worked with regional partners to permanently house over 8,000 residents who are affiliated with the city since 2020. Ending suffering on the street also requires getting people off the street as quickly as possible and also preventing them from ever experiencing homelessness. This is why the city has been a key funder and partner in the regional homelessness prevention system and helped more than 1,600 households avoid homelessness. The housing department has also been a key partner in scaling the city's emergency interim housing program together with the public works department as well as supporting eviction prevention and rent stabilization efforts intended to keep people housed. Another key part of ending suffering on the street is improving conditions on the street while people are being connected to housing. The housing department is providing expertise to shape and inform safe outdoor alternatives and supportive RV parking. The housing department remains committed to centering the voices of people who um, have experienced homelessness, both because it is a right, but also because it is a smart use of our taxpayer resources to ensure the people for whom services are being designed participate in that design. This helps maximize the use of those services. As part of the city's one team approach, the implementation plan lays out several actions the housing department is taking to address homelessness. This slide presents two examples. 
As Omar noted earlier, you can see in these examples both how they are connected directly to the regional community plan strategies and how the city has designed the plan with a built-in mechanism for reporting on outcomes and accountability for a lead department and a contact. These examples, first releasing a $50 million NOFA for permanent affordable housing, and secondly investing $4.7 million in the regional homelessness prevention system, are two among many commitments the city is making through the efforts of the housing department to end suffering on our streets. Now I'll turn the presentation over to Carla Alvarez. Thank you. There are many ways that the, city that the city shares and protects public spaces. This includes fostering access to public buildings like libraries or city hall. It also includes making parks and community centers welcoming, protecting the city's many natural resources such as waterways and, um, and even addressing hazards and fire prevention efforts related to the city's public right of way. The city's library is a valued resource by the community and one in which we continually seek to improve as a shared public space. We provide access to enriching lifelong learning opportunities with an equity lens to residents of all ages throughout the city. In the context of supporting unhoused city residents, the library has long taken a leadership role. For several years, the library has partnered with social service providers to offer direct access for vulnerable residents who visit the library to get connected to supportive services. Expanding on this work, the library developed the Holistic Library Initiative, which deepens our ability to serve as a resource and connection point for people experiencing or at risk of homelessness in our community. The Holistic Library Initiative increases opportunities for members of the, of the community to participate in peer connection programming, as well as obtain housing information at housing forums in collaboration with the housing department. The initiative can also create a path to support direct access for unhoused residents to the Regional Homeless Management Information System and Santa Clara County's MyConnect SV, a unique portal that empowers unhoused residents to view, track, and manage their own information and stay connected to service providers. Through this and other programs, the library is proud to support the city's commitment to foster equity. As part of the one team approach, we remain committed to finding and scaling new ways to further this work. This slide presents two of the measurable ways the library will do, seek to do its part to address homelessness in the city of San Jose. First, as mentioned, in support of the MyConnect SV referral system, the library will pilot access points at select libraries and train staff to assist users in accessing the system. Second, as a welcoming place to access information, the library will continue to work with corporate partners and other departments to host job fairs for unhoused individuals and other job seekers. As noted earlier, these specific city actions include outcome goals to track progress and clarify departmental accountability for leading this work. I'd like to now turn it over to John. Thank you, Carla. So Parks Recreation Services does have many roles, both with this, uh, with this line of work as well as outside of this line of work across the city. As uh, Omar mentioned just a few minutes ago, you know, one of those is addressing illegal dumping. Uh, we did report to this committee, I believe it was in October, with our blight report and gave you some statistics on illegal dumping and what's happening there. But, you know, the majority of that, it, it doesn't have much to do with homelessness at all, um, although it can often end up in homeless encampments or people dump near or by in front of homeless encampments. So it might seem like that's what's occurring, but that's not our experience. Um, to, the, to the larger point of expecting cleanliness of each other, that one of those things, you know, that dumping comes typically out of households and off construction projects and from businesses. It's, um, so that's an area where if we improve, it can help improve um, other areas, including homeless encampments. We also provide regular trash service to over 150 encampment locations throughout the city. Um, I'll talk about a metric we have for that. Um, we have added, uh, as well this year, waterways. Uh, which we just got started in November. Um, so we have a crew going up and down uh, to, to the main waterways to try to emulate a similar system where we would do regular trash service along the waterway encampments, again, to prevent that trash from accumulating as well as from it going into the waterway. We also started in the last year bioway services. Uh, now this is targeted to lived-in vehicles. Um, that's a new pilot program. Um, it is going well. There's, you know, a lot of people who live in uh, vehicles don't really have a way 
to dispose of that waste. They tend to accumulate it in containers and other ways. Uh, and so this program goes around and collects that. Um, and uh, you'll be hearing more about that from us probably as part of this budget process, how we want to increase our ability now that we started with the pilot and we have some data that we can share. Um, as many of you know, we have a cash for trash program um, that, again, it's about expecting cleanliness of each other. Um, that is to help incentivize uh, residents who are living in encampments to pick up their own trash and bag it. And as you know, we'll give them money for that, for each bag. Um, then we have enhanced cleanups and abatements when necessary. Abatements tend to be the last thing we want to really do, and enhanced cleanup is the step before that, things have really not gone well. The encampment isn't being kept up. We go in, we do a serious cleaning. We try to get the residents to follow our good neighbor policies um, and not produce more trash. Um, and of course, all of this is, is a commitment to centering the voices of people who have lived experience. Um, we have many other department department partners, um, some that I want to just shout out to real quick for the work that we do, which is the encampment management and abatement. Of course, housing, public works, planning, building code enforcement, the police, the environmental services department, the Department of Transportation, and fire all play a critical role in supporting us in one way or another um, as we go through um, all of our various uh, programs. And then a couple to highlight here, the top one there um, is an evaluation of how we do encampment management. Um, it's important to continuously evaluate this. This is an area that has a constantly shifting landscape uh, because of the courts. There's very frequent court cases that go through. Um, just in the last couple of years, I think we've been enjoined four different times as a, as a department from the work that we do, so we end up in court as well. Um, I will say, though, that we've been successful, and thank you to our city attorney's department for that. Um, uh, however, it is important to continue to re-examine uh, re what we do, to look at what other people in other cities are doing, what's working, what's not. Um, so that will be a goal of ours in 2024, to update that where it makes sense. And then one of our, uh, one of our measures here is that regular trash collection that I talked about just a minute ago trying to get there 85% of the time every week to pick up that trash. That is for the street uh, encampments, the 150 or so that I mentioned at the beginning. So that I'll hand it to Nancy next. Thank you very much, John and Rosalind for doing the clicking. Um, and good afternoon, Chair Davis and council members, committee members. I am indeed Nancy Klein, Director of Office of Economic Development and Cultural Affairs. I'm excited to be here with you today to discuss the vision of how the city can work even more and more effectively with key community partners to support our unstably housed residents. One of the key tools we have in the city toolbox is the federally funded Work to Future program. This year, the Work to Future program folks anticipate serving nearly 2,000 clients the majority of whom are unstably housed. And by unstably housed, we mean specifically those that are couch surfing, living in temporary shelters, or those who have very low income or are long-term unemployed. The vast majority of our work to future clients are those who live in the constant fear, constant risk that one missed paycheck leads to being unhoused. Last year and this year, Work to Future found unsubsidized and or subsidized employment for well over 1,200 clients. With over 75% of those individuals securing living wage employment in industries or demand occupations related to information technology, advanced manufacturing, healthcare, business and accounting, and construction and trades jobs. Work to Future provides career counseling, job readiness workshops, occupational skills training in the sectors reference just a second ago, and supportive services. In the coming year, we will continue to provide these services for hundreds of unstably housed individuals, and we will move to be even more proactive to, be, to implement a systematic, comprehensive, and holistic approach to serving this, these individuals 
with new and expanded partnerships where we together tap into each other's expertise, services, partner networks, and funding. Thank you. This slide, slide 11, demonstrates two of the ways that OEDCA is committed to the regional community plan. First, Work to Future will strive to bring its services and partners, employers, community colleges, wraparound service providers, for example, to support this critical implementation plan. We have already begun to develop targeted partnership with organizations like Hunger at Home, Bill Wilson Center, and expanding current partnerships with San Jose Conservation Corps, Metro Ed, and the County Social Service Agency. We have been working even more closely with OMAR and Work to Future staff is engaged now in the Urban Institute's Upward Mobility Initiative. Though through this initiative, we will strive to learn best practices and or emerging practices around workforce strategies for justice involved unstably housed populations. Second, as noted, OED has led an effort to establish the Collab on 2nd Street, which will serve as a physical space for partners such as housing and county staff and the Downtown Association. In addition, the space will allow individuals to meet with these partners, receive case management services, and access to behavioral health services. The actions you've heard about today are measurable steps with an identified department lead. And now I'll turn it back to Omar. Thank you, Nancy. Uh, before we close, looking ahead, there is one concept included in the implementation plan that will require further analysis and collaborative work. You will find a description of the housing continuum. This includes permanent uh, solutions like affordable home ownership, uh, rental, co-living, and supportive housing but it also includes temporary and interim options and even very basic supports like safe outdoor sleeping sites that have hygiene and bathroom options, codes of conduct, and provides safer environments than, than unregulated locations. Using data and the expertise of partners with lived experience of homelessness and others, we will seek to model how much of these various types are needed in our community. Next slide, please. A few final notes worth reiterating. This implementation plan is the next step, not the final step, in aligning, expanding, and deepening the city's approach to homelessness. Some of the actions and outcomes will become more ambitious as resources and comfort with the process grow. The key takeaway messages from this plan are, one, that the city is committed to its position as a partner and leader in addressing homelessness as part of the regional agreement in the community plan. Two, that we are expanding and coordinating the roles of the 22 departments and offices to maximize alignment and consistent approaches. And three, that we are focused on addressing this crisis for everyone in San Jose, the people who are suffering without housing or at risk of losing their housing, and the people who live in homes, run businesses, or otherwise spend time in San Jose. The vision for addressing homelessness is truly in ensuring that this is a San Jose for everyone. This concludes our presentation, and we are available for questions. Thank you. Public comment? We have a public comment on Zoom. Liz Holtz. Liz Holtz, you're unmuted. Okay, we will go to the next speaker, Gerben S. Hey, great afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Gervin S. Uh, I was the young student that sat in the uh, the front row uh, while I was preparing for finals. I have an exam right now, so I'm gonna try to keep it on uh, short. Um, something that I noticed, like with the the ending uh, homeless uh, homelessness uh, project, uh, it's it's a great one in theory. Um, but I think sometimes um, because of the stigma, we sometimes forget that we have students that are um working exponentially hard, like in terms of like, you know, going out and working 40 hours uh, work weeks like myself and then still having to go to school. And right now I'm in the process of trying to uh, transfer to Stanford University, you know, a top 10 school. And when I reached out to a lot of people, you know, in the board and in the in the city about trying to see if there was any grants or anything available, you know, nobody reached out back to me. So the thing is, is that I'm going to have to end up self-funding that while still working 
and still having, you know, to pay rent. And the thing is, is like, once I go back to being homeless, you know, I'm going to have this stigma, you know, if I don't keep it up, the, the fact that I'm not working hard enough, you know, which I am. So I wanted to see if you guys could address this. Um, As always, my number is 786-355-9729. Um, I definitely want to show you guys like an example of my story and other uh, other student stories that go to um, West Valley Mission College, you know, who have, who have goals and aspirations, but, you know, just given the cost of living and everything like that, it's very difficult to, um, you know, maintain everything, especially as a youth member. So I wanted to see what part about expanding, you know, the public support would you guys be able to have? And is it possible? Is there something in the general fund that you guys can work with the city to be able to have something like, hey, you're doing this STEM project. We can be able to support you, given we know that you're already paying for rent and all these things. So um, I yield my time and uh, thank you guys again. Thank you, Speaker Ann. Hi, <clears throat> my name is Ann DeShane. I live in Hamilton Place, so I'm in Dev Davis's um, area. Uh, my neighbors and I have called many times, emailed the mayor, emailed Dev Davis, emailed Valley Water, emailed the homeless. We have the huge homeless encampment going on on the Las Gatos Creek Trail between Bascom and Lee. Ever since the porta potty was put up there, there's even more homeless going up in there. They steal the water from my association. The crime is going up. Uh, you know, I understand about homeless. I feel really bad about it. But now it's unsafe to walk on the creek trail. And the creek is not a campground. So I don't know what else can be done, but my neighbors and I are at wit's end. I've lived in my townhouse for 22 years, and it's never been this bad as the last two or three years. So I'm not sure what can be done, but if anything can be done to help with that encampment, we would all really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Liz Holtz. Hi, uh, thank you everyone. As you know, I'm a cat advocate. Uh, one of the things I wanted to ask is, has the uh, animal services portion been added to the homeless plan? Um, a lot of the, you know, like the arena hotel and stuff are pets allowed at most of these facilities. Um, if they are, are they being vaccinated and spayed or neutered? Um, you know, what about when they clear the encampments? We know there have been a lot of times when animals have been left behind, when there's been problems with coordination. Um, a couple months ago, you guys rolled out the big you know, a uh, roadmap of Beautify SJ and nowhere in there was animal services or animal control mentioned at all. Um, there's been, you know, thank goodness for people like, um, now I'm going to forget her name. Anyways, uh, that runs the St. Francis of Assisi, um, Kim McIntyre, because she has got out and work in these communities to help get animals medical care to get them spayed and neutered and vaccinated and stuff like that but this needs to be not only a part of the plan for clearing these homeless encampments and for re you know housing or whatever um but also you know animal services needs to be working with uh oefs you know to be able to house on on you know short-term notice when you're clearing encampments from the creeks during the winter months you need a place to put those animals and now you have to be able to put them with their people so i hope you take that into account and add it thank you back to the committee thank you councilmember candelas thank you chair um thank you staff for the presentation on words uh, it's it's very um, uplifting to see our, our holistic approach that we're taking to the to the challenge and and not uh, and not just treating folks who are you know either at the risk of being homeless or actually unhoused and already um, it's 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 especially uh, challenging knowing the situation that we are in because of the cost of living in our valley. And I know there's folks who are frustrated. I mean, we heard it in public comment with folks living along trails, the waterways, near community centers, et cetera. Um, and so I, I think it's it's important that that we are, you know, not just looking at the root cause of it 
and seeing what we can do to prevent folks from becoming homeless, but seeing how we can uh, put people on a pipeline to once we have them temporarily housed, permanently housed. And I, I know I'm preaching to the choir here, uh, but, but it's important to reflect that. And, and especially with our, our temporary um, housing options that we are working to, to spruce up. And I know we've, we, uh, we heard about this during council earlier this week of how we can how we could more quickly set up, whether it's RV parking spaces or, uh, or, or temporary homes. Um, and, and I applaud staff for their effort in trying to get us up as quickly as possible. But I, I do want to, you know, uh, be, be mindful and, 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 and talk a little bit about um, the, the, the impending challenge with regards to the ongoing um, commitment that we're making for the general fund. Um, you know, that's highlighted in the, in the report that by 2829, uh, if we build out the 1,000 beds, 280 hotel rooms, 156 parking spaces, we are going to be incurring a nearly $60 million uh, commitment to serve these uh, placements, which, which are, are, are needed. I'm not, I'm not I'm, let me preempt, we need to do this, but, um, but you know, so a lot of these social services, behavioral health services should, um, you know, be done in partnership with, you know, our, 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 uh, our peers in the county. Um, and seeing how we can be strategic about that approach is, is something I'm hoping that we can, can tie into this work plan. Um, or else uh, nearly $40 million from our general fund is going to be affected come that. And so it's, it's, it's something to think about um, because, you know, uh, like everybody likes to say, it's trade-offs, right? We do more for temporary homes for, for people, uh, for the unsheltered population, but it comes at a cost. What are we willing to trade off from the general fund to do this? And so um, uh, it's, no challenge, it's no easy feat, so I applaud staff for bringing us the best recommendations on a pathway forward, and, and it's as always, the, the reports are enlightening and uh, and or uh, uh, a little bit uh, um, hard to swallow. But but you know that's that's what we signed up for. So uh, that being said, uh, I'll yield the rest of my time. Thanks, Chair. Councilmember, if I could just briefly on the issue of the collaboration with the county. So the county's just been a an, a, a really tremendous partner for throughout this process. I mean, not only in developing the backbone for the plan together with organizations like Destination Home and the County Housing Authority, but also very specifically, when the federal government made it, like forced the Guadalupe Gardens clearance, it was the, the county stepped forward to partner and provide uh, pathways for people into housing. That has continued. We actually have ongoing conversations with their Office of Supportive Housing, Behavioral Health Services, uh, so the health and hospital system all around what are the ways that we can potentially collaborate on getting into the coordinated entry system in a larger way so that we leverage more of the resources that they have to, to better support from a regional perspective. And then also I would add that the other really big opportunity that is with the, um, the states, it's called CalAIM, I don't need to go all the way down the rabbit hole, but the short version is that the, the state created a pathway for health plans to help cover some of these costs some of the costs that uh, Jim Shannon is, is very good about including. So we're really looking at ways to potentially get uh, offset some of the city's longer term exposure. Perfect. No, thank you. Thank you, Omar. And it, it's not to say that we don't have a, a good working relationship. Absolutely. I, I speak with uh, with our supervisor, uh, Supervisor Adanis, who, who represents my, my, my district um, regularly. And, and not to say that we don't have that, but I just want to lean in on ensure that staff is leaning in on that. And I'm, I'm, I'm happy to hear that we are and that they are being great partners. That wasn't already, that hasn't historically uh, been, been, uh, been the situation for those of us who been serving in some sort of public office here in, since 2012, but I appreciate that, Omar, and, and that just, I hope we are able to lean in and continue to do that and, and establish and nurture that relationship, and whether it's seeking, uh, you know, the, the, that, that federal reimbursement for health services through Medicaid, through, the, through whatever kind of federal and or state reimbursement, I mean, that's, that's fantastic, and, and I, I applaud uh, staff for, for doing that, and I hope we, we can continue to do that uh, in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Torres. Great. Uh, thank you so much for the presentation. And obviously, we see many departments here. So 
it's it's very important to to let everyone know that uh, when we tackle homelessness in in our city, right? It's uh, it, all 22 departments are dealing with it, right? But primarily those that are dealing with it even more are here in in this uh, in this room. So so I appreciate all of your all your work. Thank you so much for for the presentation. Uh, I actually wanted to just ask a, a couple of questions. Um, so I know that right before some of us beca became council member, uh, there was an increase of penalties for folks who were illeg illegally dumping, uh, especially when it came to business contractors doing it, right? And I saw it in the presentation. Uh, and my question is, increasing the fine or the penalty, did that, did that actually help? So yeah, that would be with our illegal dumping, you mean? It, it really hasn't changed much because the issue, yes, the fines, you know, making the fines more intimidating is always good, but the reality is on the back end, we just don't have much in the way of bandwidth for enforcement, right, to follow through on what we see on a camera or what someone might report to us with, a, with plates and information. So in any given year, we don't see a lot of enforcement of that. Okay, and so, Maybe we should re, is that something that we should revisit to make sure that we are enforcing or will enforcement come from SJPD? Yeah, we talked about this and we talked, we were here again, in, I think in October talking about blight and we talked about this specific thing. Remember the three E's, right? Eradication, education, enforcement. And this is an area where long time ago, you know, we had details and PD support and code enforcement support. Uh, this was back when it was in environmental services. You, you know, you go through those budget years in the mid 2000s there, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, but so many things were cut away and many of those kind of extra enforcement programs just went to the wayside and haven't really returned in any substantial way. So any enforcement we do is someone else's extra ancillary duty. Um, and so like, for example, with cameras, if you put up a camera, you have to sit, and, somebody has to sit there and watch all those hours of camera footage to find out when this happened or where it occurred and then determine if there's a violation and if that violation can be followed through on. It just takes a lot of time and hours that we simply just don't have resources devoted to in the city. All right, thank you for that, by the way. Um, wasn't the answer that I, I wanted, but uh, you know, that's, it is, it is what it is, right? I know that uh, it, it is important for us to, to make sure that you know, business contractors don't come into our city, because we know which districts are dumping them, right? Council District 3, 5, 7, right? Those are the, those, that's where we see the most illegal dumping, right? Not associated with our encampments, right? You know, I'm, I, I know that we deal with our encampments, but I've always let folks know that, you know, when there's mattresses on a corner of a neighbor, a resident, our unhoused income do it, you know? so. Uh, you know, sometimes we need to separate that, right? That blight is sometimes created by, you know, local contractors who come into our city and, and literally dump their stuff in, in, in our city, right? Uh, and so, you know, I've always tried to let folks know that we're not, we shouldn't always tie, you know, our unhoused with blight or with crime. Yes, it happens, and yes, it's part of it, but it's not entirely uh, the, the accurate story, right? Um, I know that that last... I remember that meeting now. We've, <laughs> we've, had, we, we've had so many meetings, right? So uh, I think since that meeting, I think that my, my comments at that last meeting were also that we need to work with our dear friends from the Apartments Association to let our apartment uh, landlords or slumlords, because some of them are, um, know that when folks are moving out of their, their apartment, that it is their responsibility to, to haul that away. Because what we're seeing down 10th and 11th Street is a lot of, or in other areas where there's, lot, there's you know, a, a huge apartments, right? Apartment villages in our city, is that uh, you know, our city has to come out and, and do the work that they're supposed to be doing, right? So, um, so I've, I've said it once, I've said it twice. I'm no fan of, of our, you know, the apartment association, but they need to, you know, start pulling their weight as well, you know, so. Um, we agree, um, and, that, and that is something we're trying to figure out, as well as the other dumping that you mentioned. The, um, 
I will remind folks though, you know, we do have a free dump pickup program in this city that's run through ESD. All you gotta do is call them and someone will come out and pick that right. up. You don't have to throw it out in the street and things like that. It does take a little bit of planning ahead. So obviously if it's an emergency situation, maybe it's not as simple, but in most cases, you know you're probably moving you know, before tomorrow. Um, so you can call ahead and just ask and you can leave that heavy stuff out there and they'll pick it up free. So. Right, and so, and, and the other question I did have is another question from one of our, uh, you know, our audience members. You know, I usually don't do this, but they're not Pasoto, so I'll just, I'll just ask it away. Um, but I think you're not in your head, Rosalind, when, when the lady, when the gal who just uh, joined us on Zoom, the cat activist who said that if we're tying uh, encampment sweeps with our animal care shelter, care shelter. Yes, thank you so much, Councilmember Torres. Absolutely. Um, one of the things that we are learning, and we are learning as we go, as we put up uh, interim housing uh, facilities, is that um, for our, our residents, having their pets with them is really important. So that's one of the things that we're including in design for both our interim housing uh, as well as safe parking sites. Um, for example, just Tuesday at City Council, we brought the Barry as the site before you, and that will include um, areas for, for pets. Okay, great, and thank you. And then before I yield back my time, I think Angel uh, mentioned something that Kim is actually funded through. Yeah, it, actually through, through Animal Care and Services, we actually have a subcontract with Kim McIntyre over at St. Francis to do exactly that, to provide some support. Um, and she's really busy with all that. So whenever we do any type of uh, abatement, any major cleanup, she definitely is one of the first responders, has done a superb job. If anything, I think we may need to expand that work. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Great. Thank you. Councilmember Ortiz. Thank you, uh, Madam Chairwoman. Um, I want to thank the staff from all the departments um, that have come together to work on this very important plan. Um, while a lot of this is codifying our existing uh, efforts to implement the county plan, it's great to be able to look at the totality of our efforts and go into the next year with um, some, some concrete goals. Uh, just to you know, piggyback off of uh, Councilmember Candelas, I am concerned about the growing costs of our current um, strategy uh, to support our houseless community. I, I think that uh, we need to have very, very careful conversations as we enter into the budget because we can't bankrupt our city um, with the with the um, decisions that we're making in order to mitigate houselessness. And I'm not willing to close down libraries and community centers um, for for that strategy either because my my residents deserve resources. Um, and I also want to just piggyback off of uh, Councilmember Torres. I know that illegal dumping isn't the main topic of this, but my, many of our districts here, Councilmember Davis does get illegal dumping as well, uh, but many of us here, um, uh, our, our districts, you know, we wake up every morning and our residents see trash on their streets, they see trash on their corners, and they're not trash. Their families aren't trash, but that's the message that they're being sent uh, every day on the street. So. Uh, I think that that's probably one of the main issues in my district, um, and, and I really hope that, and I know our city's, uh, city's um, uh, doing everything we can, but these issues are complex, and you know, it's, you try one strategy, it may not work, we've got to try another strategy. So you have my office's commitment um, to, to prioritize that um, as we have our conversations. One thing that I've talked a lot about um, since I've been on this council and just given my pre previous career is workforce development. So I'm really excited to see um, that during the work plan, we're prioritizing developing partnerships with Work to Future. Um, I know we already have partnerships with them, but partnerships within this plan uh, and community agencies to specifically serve our, our justice, justice impacted uh, and unstably housed individuals, right? Because the individuals who unfortunately are justice involved or who are experiencing trauma or aren't able to get services today, the youth who are experiencing that today are unfortunately on path to be houseless uh, individuals. And, and I truly believe that a strong workforce development tool is essential for working people to build uh, a sustainable life. You know, in, here in Silicon Valley, 
uh, a lot of people were able to sustain jobs in the past, you know, being in the service industry. But unfortunately, now people are having to work two or even three jobs uh, in order to keep food on, on the table. I know that, that was the situation for my mom, and, and she worked for Kaiser. Uh, I was hoping to get a little bit more information uh, about a few items. First, first question, are there any community-based organizations in particular we're forming partnerships with, or is it still early in the process to say for this strategy? Thank you very much, Councilmember Torres and Ortiz. Ortiz. It's okay. Ortiz. It happens all the time. It happens all the time. Yeah. So sorry. That's very embarrassing. He's good looking too. So you know. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Um, both, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so so we listed a couple of um, uh, partnerships that we mentioned. Uh, in, in the slide, but I want to highlight the work that we're hoping to be doing with Hunger at Home. Mm -hmm. As an example, they have a, they do a tremendous catering business with Full Circle and Denari, who, who runs that program, the executive CEO of that program, was formerly the head chef at Levi's. He's mm -hmm. very skilled oh. in what he does. And he specifically brings on people who are unstably housed or previously home, homeless and teaches them, a, the, he's so good because he teaches a great deal of soft skills. So that going through the program, sorry, and going through the training for um, the restaurant industry, there's a myriad number of jobs, but they also, um, through that program with Denari, work to, to be really easily moved or much more easily moved into other industries. So there's the partnership with Work to Future. There's a eight week program that Hunger at Home does and they will be co-enrolled mm. into Work to Future and getting both sets of services available to them at the, at it, most of them at the same time. That's great. That Councilmember Ortiz, I think the one, it's really, I think, also useful to note that the CSIP Credit Collective, the Sa uh, Santa Clara County Housing Authority, and uh, the Santa Clara County Office of Supportive Housing have all sort of locked arms with our Office of Economic Development and Cultural Affairs and our Office of Race and, Equ uh, Race and Equity to specifically focus on upward mobility, targeting some of the portions of San, uh, San Jose that are most um, challenged. Lots of uh, opportunity, but also some challenges. And so there's a real specific push with those organizations as well. How about targeting our um, Vietnamese population? Do we have any partners in that area? We have some work that we're doing in the Vietnamese community. We need to do more. Okay. And the other thing we need to do more that wasn't specifically mentioned, you didn't yet ask about it, but I'm excited about it, which is working with the programs that are serving those who are about to come out of the prison system. Oh, great. That's really great. Thank you. There's a lot of things to be excited about. Um, I will. Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> Uh, sometimes I forget to move for approval, so my friend, my colleague was just <laughs> reminding me to do that. Uh, I, I'm interested in, in, in what staff's learning uh, about uh, in regards to the best practices to serve with these sensitive populations um, as we work with Urban Institute. Um, is Work to Future tailoring any programming or planning to tailor any programming for the un unique needs of the unstably housed? It's early days. Yeah. And yeah. what we're looking at are best practices, as mentioned, and upcoming practices. I'll turn to Sangeeta. If there's anything that you'd like to add of specifics, or we'll come back and report as we get going a little bit more on this. OK. Yeah, you got to come, come down, down to the mic. <laughs> Sangeeta, just to introduce her, does a tremendous amount of work specifically in this area for work. Thank you future. for being here. Right here, right here. The hot seat. State your name. Good afternoon, council members, and thank you for the question. So one of the partnerships that we're trying to develop in order to create best practices is through the Urban Institute. So we're, this is, again, it's very much in its infant stage, but we are learning a lot of um, uh, modalities as to how best to serve this population and also providing our case managers the expertise and uh, to, to be more trauma-informed. So uh, this is, again, this is something that it's a work in progress, and we hope that, uh, uh, that we are better um, 
uh, we're expert, a better expert, we have the expertise to, to uh, provide better uh, holistic services to, uh, to uh, address some of the uh, barriers that this population is facing, so, yeah. That's great, I'm glad yeah. that this is at the forefront of your mind as you enter um, the strategy. And then finally, my, my last question, in terms of placements for these specific clients, um, are there employers we're seeing as ideal partners that we could have in the pipeline for these individuals who take these training? Because it's not just about training. We've got to make sure they're hired and they get a paycheck. Yes, Sangeeta, do you want to respond to that first? Um, yes. Um, so uh, one, of the, one of our strategies is to really focus our hiring uh, practices around our priority sectors, as shared earlier, mm -hmm. in advanced manufacturing, in healthcare in uh, accounting and finance. So really trying to focus our, uh, pla uh, our placement strategies around these industry sectors that, that offer the career-oriented uh, job opportunities as well as um, uh, providing with them with living wage and so forth. So, and just to highlight what was in the notes, which you get talked at a lot, so um, the, over the last two years, about 1,200 people have been placed. And in, oh, in the existing work in future. Yeah, and, and, and many of them are placed in these five industries, and 75% of them have gone on to permanent work. Mm -hmm. So the strategies and the linkages with a wide variety of companies work well, partly because there's a lot of vacancies. Yeah. And partly because the soft skills and the beginnings of the technical skills are working for what they're doing with work to future, but the partners as well. That's great. The, the reason why I mentioned like reaching out to these specific hiring partners is, you know, there's, there's no secret. Sometimes there is, is prejudice in, in hiring um, in, in certain work, work fields. Um, and so it's, it's good to have in intentional agreements with employers to let them know we are actively trying to lift up these populations. And by doing this, they're being a partner in addressing the, the, the houseless crisis here in, in the city of San Jose. So it'd be good to, I don't know if there's like MOUs or active agreements we could have with these employers so that they realize the, the, the good that they're doing in the community and also they're intentional with their hiring practices. I'll just mention one thing. If, if a girl can dream, it would yeah. be great to not have to use WIA funds to do it. Yep. And the reason I say that is when we get those agreements with companies, there's a lot of reporting. Oh, I and see. It's, it's, it's hard work. Um, so if there were a funding stream that were a little less on onerous, I think we'd get even more participation yeah. by corporate side. Yeah, my, my last role, we actually didn't pursue we uh, funding because of, because of that. We owe uh, funding because it too much... Um, paperwork, it's too compliance based and not focus on the, the results. Well, thank you, appreciate it. Thank you for uh, you know answering my questions and looking forward to the progress on this. Thank you, council member. Council member Dewan. Thank you, chair. Uh, thank you, staff, uh, putting together this uh, extensive uh, report. In the um, attachment B, page 18, there's a little short mention of um, Rand Corporation, County of Santa Clara produced a study of the amount of uh, needs for some of these type of bed in the region in 2023. Can you clarify what the result of that study? It's a, it's a, uh, Council Member Duan Omar Pastens here. It's a like multi-page sort of tome. We put the, the link down there to provide additional information. Uh, I think it won't surprise you because they've also done a workforce study that there's a shortage relative to the need, but I, I don't have the, the quantified information here. We can certainly get a copy of that over um, if you'd like or, or in connect with the, the, uh, the county that authored or published it. All right, please do. Um, <clears throat> the other question I have for you is this. While we're working to find permanent housing for our unhoused residents, in the meantime, there, there's a huge amount of unhoused residents are out there in the street. What are we doing to create what you call temporary housing to get the population off the street? So maybe I'll start with that and then see if, if Rosalind wants to, to add anything. I, there's a, a multi bronx strategy that we've been sort of talking about several times here, right? right. You're familiar with, I think, a, a push to increase the sort of interim interim housing that you, you're, the council approved the 
multiple sites over the last year. I think over 600 total uh, units approved. So that's part of it. I think one of the things that we continue to look at, it's in the community plan to end homelessness, it's referenced here in this implementation plan, are other strategies that can help people be safe uh, in, in, in managed locations or regulated locations around the city. And so we're, we're in the process of trying to sort of urgently find out where and when that's possible. The emergency declaration that you all uh, adopted earlier made, made that more possible. So those are some of the things we're looking at. So, so when, it, when we declaration of uh, emergency, um, I believe that in a crisis, you act within the crisis. So why aren't we erecting like temporary tent with cots that allow our unhoused residents to be in there, right? With, with surround with services, obviously, and, and heating and air conditioning as well. Yeah, so, so uh, council member, what, what I'd say is sort of two things. One, uh, we sort of operate within the constraints of the, of the adopted budget, and so we're talking about what are the tools that are available to us, but also having lived and worked in a community that had several of those large sort of like mash tent style structures um, and seen the, the results n not bear out what we're seeing with interim housing in, in the city of San Jose, which has, by the way, some of the, the best results on the West Coast, um, I, I would just say, it's, it's one of those things where we have to be aggressive on alternatives, and so finding ways that are effective um, are, is important, uh, but we also want to be careful. Um, not everything that seems like the most immediate response to an emergency is the, the best or most effective or, or most, um, um, well, most effective way to, to handle it. So, so as, a, as a refugee that came over from a, a different country, uh, my families and many family live in tents for for months and months and years, and community bathroom outside, and it works for us, right? That's uh, come from the, uh, our U.S. military. And then as a previous unhoused resident, I, I'd rather be in a, I don't care, a four by four or four by six area away from the cold weather or the heat. Um, I, I think that sometimes we, we overthink. We're, we're, a lot of time we think about like, Permanent housing, and which has cost us anywhere between 1.2 to 1.4 million dollars uh, per door, not per building. In a crisis, again, it's it's an emergency to get people off the street. We need to think out of the box, and 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 the military has been doing this for for years in every country, and and I experienced that with my family and many other families, so. I think we could use that model if we just take a look at it. Yeah, and I think, so I want to be really clear about what we are looking at. I mean, I received copies of the, the budgets and contracts that the city of San Diego has used for its uh, safe sleeping sites. There's another jurisdiction in Northern California that supplied its information. We, we are continuing as a city staff to, to, to push for different models that will allow people a safe, dignified space to be. So I, I don't want you to think that we're not. I just was providing a little bit of context for you and your colleagues around those, those sort of large sort of mass structures that can sometimes feel like a, a good idea, but when you get a chance to spend some time uh, learning about what those experiences are like, the, sometimes the smaller ones actually end up bearing, bearing out a little bit better. Yeah, thank you. And, and I, I know that we're all always talking about dignity and respect. Yes, I understand that. Um, but community bathroom is a very common thing in military, even in the fire department as, as we speak, right? We use community bathroom. Uh, and I think it's, it's cut the cost of having an individual bathroom within a, you know, emergency in room housing. Um, again, I, I just want to make my point clear that we, we need to do something to get the unhoused resident off the street in a, in a temporary manner, um, quickly and efficiently. And I, I know it's a, extremely difficult with the budget, extreme, extremely difficult with the resource that we have and the land use and so on. I just want to say thank you for all you do. Thank you, and I just I want to applaud and really be grateful for Chair, Chair Davis, for example, and the other members of the, uh, the committee who have found locations within their communities uh, and worked with their constituents to create those spaces. One of the things that we need, uh, Councilmember Duan, to do more of what you're uh, recommending is the ability to have our, our leaders partner and, and identify locations where we can help get people transitioned off the street. So, so that's an example of a way that we can work together on that. Yes, and as we speak, I, I, I work with both some private, 
properties and, and, and even public trying to find space for not only for temporary housing, but also RVs. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Torres. Move to approve item D2. Second. And this is also cross reference oh, and cross to the full well. council. Is that right, Angel? Angel? Okay. Yes. Yep. As well as cross referencing it. Okay. Cross referencing it. Thank you. All right. Thank you. I just have a, a couple of comments. Um, I, I didn't know before this, I, I think I already told you this, um, Omar, but I didn't know before this report how active the library has been with our homeless and unsheltered population. So I just want to thank you, the library, for your, all of your programs. Um, and, and I think it's really good. It's very good to hear that there is more coordination happening with the county, more and more coordination happening with the county um, on this issue, and that there is hope for funding our ongoing costs of EIH sites. I do share that concern uh, with, with my colleagues here on the council. So um, do you happen to know, Omar, what the timeline might be on that Cal AIM support for EIH? So for, for portions of it, so we literally have a meeting tomorrow, gotcha. um, but, but the, uh, there's an, a, a desire for rollout if we can cross all the T's and dot all the I's and everything for the next cycle, like July, July 1 is the target for mm -hmm. the rollout of some of those. So I, I don't want to, that date is clear. There's a lot of hoops to jump through before we get there. Okay, great. Um, if you could add that to, to your report when, when this item comes to council in I assume January. Um, that would be really helpful, I think. And I, the other thing I wanted to say is, I, I also appreciate in the in the memo that there is going to be a larger homelessness annual report and implementation plan update coming every year in the fall. Um, we've gotten dribs and drabs a, a lot of times, and I've been asking for one place for a long time. So I really appreciate that that's getting put together and all of the things that it will contain. Thank you. All right, um, we're ready for the vote. Do you want to try it? Okay. Okay, all in favor? Aye. All right, motion carries. Thank you. And we'll go now to open forum. There's no public comment back to the committee. Okay, thank you, then we're adjourned.